have tackled many strange stories on 60 Minutes, but perhaps none like this. Here to discuss, Luis Elizondo, former director of the Pentagon's Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. UFOs have captivated the public interest for decades, but they've always been dismissed, including by me as the province of wackos. Luis Elizondo is a former military intelligence official and currently works with the Stars Academy and the History Channel, and he joins us now. My name is Lou Elizondo. For nearly the last decade, I ran a sensitive aerospace threat identification program. It was in this position I learned that the phenomena is indeed real. And now as a member of or to the Stars Academy, completely none of them have an object and I think it's important These aircraft, will, apparently, uh, that are moving in ways that appear to violate physics, that are flying very differently from any aircraft ever observed, that and the US way government has actually any indeed been dealing with this issue for, for over 70 years. years. What is this? And that's a little well, bit problematic, know, because, because if we say this is foreign adversarial technology, we know that the Russians... On October 14, 2017, Luis Lou Daniel Elizondo IV stepped on stage in Seattle, Washington, announcing to the world that the UFO phenomenon was real. It was in this position I learned that the phenomena is indeed real. Lou would instantly rise to the top of the UFO subculture, being backed by a global media campaign labeling him as a Pentagon UFO whistleblower. Previous to this day, no one outside of the military intelligence community, a few politicians, and a close-knit circle of defense industry contractors had ever heard of the name Lou Elizondo. Very little is known about Mr. Elizondo beyond the biography that is listed on his website at lewiselizondoofficial.com. There remain to this day some very serious and alarming unanswered questions about Lou, his background, and his claims. Every piece of evidence obtained in the making of this documentary was located during a thorough search of public records available on the internet. While such information is considered public, I have gone to great lengths to protect the privacy of every individual mentioned in this piece, while only including information that is entirely relevant in an attempt to answer the question of, who's Lou? In order to be completely transparent, a full bibliography of original copies of the research material obtained during the making of this film, along with source reference links, is being made publicly available on the website www.whoslewmovie.com. Who's Lou? Hello, I'm Tom DeLong, and thanks for joining us live today. So I want you to all meet Lou Elizondo. Well, thanks, Tom, for that very um, special introduction. My name is Lou Elizondo, and as a career intelligence officer, I am accustomed to being involved in close-hold, nuanced programs involving national security. This includes being a counterintelligence special agent, a case officer, and an intelligence practitioner. However, by far the most interesting effort I was involved with was the topic of advanced aerial threats. For nearly the last decade, I ran a sensitive aerospace threat identification program focusing on unidentified aerial technologies. It was in this position I learned that the phenomena is indeed real. Navigating to LuisElizondoOfficial.com 
Louis Lou Elizondo, former senior intelligence official, disclosure advocate, national security expert, former director of the Pentagon's UFO UAP program, ATIP. In three years, we have achieved the unimaginable together, and this is just the beginning. My mission. My mission is to challenge the status quo of the past 75 years of UFO UAP secrecy and champion its disclosure in a meaningful way that ultimately leads to a better, more comprehensive understanding of this great enigma. My approach is a deliberate and calculated effort to challenge current mindsets and policies in order to enable collaboration across all governments, people, institutions, academia, and scientific communities. Lou plainly states that his mission is to challenge the status quo of the past 75 years of UFO and UAP secrecy. And he states, quote, In three years we have achieved the unimaginable together, and this is just the beginning, end quote. However, it is unclear what, if anything, Lou has actually achieved on the topic of disclosure. Some people credit Lou with the supposed recent involvement of Congress in the UFO and UAP phenomenon. In June, the United States government is set to release a public report on everything it knows about UFOs. Others counter that Congress has been interested in the phenomenon for a very long time, resulting in such programs as ATIP and its predecessor, AWSAP, in the first place, going all the way back to Project Blue Book, Sign, and Grudge in the 1940s. Some people have speculated that the mainstream media attention brought to the subject of ufology by Mr. Elizondo is a benefit for UFO disclosure. While others feel that the one-sided media attention is a detriment and is suspect as no one truly knows who paid for it. Some people believe that Lou is truly a champion for UFO disclosure, while others believe that his actions benefit only himself and the defense industry which stands to profit out of a partial disclosure of weapons technology. And so I must ask this question. What exactly has Lou Elizondo contributed to the disclosure process, and whose interest is he truly representing? These will be the first of many unanswered questions and contradictions that arise when we look at the public image and statements made by Mr. Elizondo and then compare them to the evidence and facts, and then we ask the question of... Who's Lou? Career Intelligence Officer with The United States Army the United States Department of Defense, the United States Office of National Counterintelligence Executive, the United States Office of the Director of National Intelligence, Program Manager, Director for ATIP, Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, Senior Intelligence Operations Officer, National Strategic Policy and Strategy Development, Foreign and Domestic Intelligence and Information Sharing, Intelligence and Law Enforcement Integration Supervised and Conducted Espionage and Terrorism Investigations Around the Globe Managed Clandestine Source Operations Throughout the Middle East and Latin America From the images and statements on the Luis Elizondo official webpage, you get an idea of how Lou portrays himself to the world. His image is one of a stoic soldier that has an impressive list of credentials including the title of director of the Pentagon's UFO and UAP program called ATIP, or the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. Lou claims lofty achievements in the disclosure process and he appears to be a champion of truth. His stated mission is to apparently force the end of UAP and UFO secrecy. However, Lou fails to mention any details of an actual plan to obtain his objective. And so, while this statement sounds amazing on its surface, it makes me question if Lou actually has a plan for disclosure, or if he is simply winging it and telling us what we want to hear. But before we get into all that, let's start at the beginning. Let's go back to Lou's childhood. I 
I'm the son of a Cuban immigrant father who was a dissident of the Castro regime. My father spent time as a political prisoner for his involvement in the Bay of Pigs. I grew up in South Florida and, as a young man, I was often exposed to my father's efforts in helping change the political situation in Cuba. Lou says very little about his childhood on his official webpage. He merely mentions growing up in Florida, the son of a Cuban revolutionary immigrant, and then going to the University of Miami and getting a degree. However, it appears that there is much more to Lou's early life story than is portrayed in the official narrative, and that makes perfect sense. Because who can truly sum up the first 21 years of their life or so in two simple statements like, I was born here and I graduated college there. There simply has to be more to this story than we see here. In fact, Lou himself admitted as much on a pair of recent livestream appearances, making these two seemingly contradictory statements. Yeah, that was my life. I'll tell you right now. I think, you know, I, I, and I think with age, hopefully comes experience and maturity. Um, I, I, my young age, I was a, a pretty angry young man um, yeah. because of my, the, the situation my parents went through, fairly dysfunctional, unfortunately. We lost everything. Um, and, and that's really in large part because of, of the incredible upbringing I had from my from my mother and my father. My mother, God bless her soul, she's, she's no longer with us, but... But my father, the man, the myth, the legend, uh, you know, the guy who was in the Brigade 2506 and taught me how to be a, a human, how, how, to, how to make sure you give back more than you take, is right next to me. Uh, and my, my, my father, my hero, uh, Luis Elizondo, so uh, senior. So, Pops, uh, say hi to everybody. Hello, everybody. I'm very happy to be here sharing this moment with my son and his friends your friends, now my friends. Uh, well, it's true that I did certain things in the past. The reality is that Louis has made it come a reality. In everything that I hope I could have ever done, he has surpassed it. As a son, as a father, as a friend, as a neighbor, as a boss, as an employee, as a patriot, he is number one. Who's Lou? Lou's father, Luis Elizondo III, has stated that he was a member of Brigade 2506, which was a part of the Bay of Pigs invasion in April of 1961. Brigade 2506 had connections to the Central Intelligence Agency and was formed by Cuban exiles that were trained by the CIA and then would later return to attack their homeland in an attempt to overthrow Fidel Castro. I hope the members of the brigade will sit down again. This will be very... Uh, standing over there uh, is a, a Cuban patriot, uh, 57, 159, 161. I wonder if those three could stand so that... Members of the brigade, members of their family, are following an historic road. One which has been followed by other Cubans in other days, and indeed by other patriots of our hemisphere in other years. Juarez, San Martin, Bolivar, O'Higgins, all of whom fought for liberty, many of whom were defeated, many of whom went in exile, and all of whom came home. I was able to confirm that there is a Luis D. Elizondo Garcia registered on and shown on the Brigade 2506 Memorial website as a member of Compania O, or Company O. I can only assume that this is indeed Luis Daniel Elizondo III, despite the surname of Garcia. So I think it's reasonably safe to conclude that the story of the senior Elizondo and his Bay of Pigs connections is most likely true and that a young Lou would grow up hearing stories of his father's revolutionary days back in the fight against Castro. Lou Elizondo states on his official biography that he grew up in Florida. 
However, a search of public internet records revealed that Luis Daniel Elizondo IV was born in 1972 near Houston, Texas to Luis Daniel Elizondo III and Janice Maria. Are humble. You live in Harris County and you pay to operate it. Your county is a big operation. It's Houston and then some. Not much is known about the young Elizondo family during the first few years of Lou's life. However, it seems that right from the get-go, we have an inconsistency or gray area in the story of Who's Lou, because Lou's official webpage omits the fact that he was born in Texas and might have spent some time there as a child. A seemingly small inconsistency for sure, however, this is just the first of many unanswered questions and contradictions that will arise when we ask, Who's Lou? Times change, but there's always one place the whole world thinks of for sunshine. For turning your face to the skies and feeling that gentle touch of warmth. Where the sun says to you, lie down my friend and let me toast your bones till the tiredness disappears and all the abuse of winter melts away and you feel alive again. Florida. Sometime before 1978, the Elizondo family moved to Sarasota, Florida, and it seemed like things were not going too badly for the young couple and their new son. They had put down some roots and they started a new business together. It was called Pomerola Incorporated. There is no indication of what sort of business Pomerola Incorporated actually was, but there is something peculiar about this business filing. The registered agent for the business is Luis Elizondo, and the principal place of business is on Adams Drive. However, Janice, Lou's mother, lists an address on Hidden Oak Terrace as an officer and shares that address with a young Lou who is also listed as an officer of the company at the tender age of six. So far as I know, there is no law against people listing their minor children as co-owners on a business and this could be entirely innocent. The mere fact alone of two parents listing a child as a co-owner on a business proves nothing. However, the types of people to employ such business tactics are normally the extremely wealthy, or at least those people that are worried about the high inheritance tax paid on generational wealth. And it appears that at this stage in their lives, the Elizondos were simply not those types of people. So this is just one of the many contradictions that arise when we ask, who's Lou? Whatever type of business Pomerola Incorporated was, it seems that it ran smoothly for a few years as they paid taxes and filed corporate filings for the years of 1981, 82, and 83. But then the business seemed to fall apart and was dissolved in 1984. That same year, Lou's parents would start another business, RPG&E Incorporated, and Lou's father would start a solo venture called Wheels International. Again, we can only speculate as to what these businesses were. However, they would both also ultimately fail and be legally dissolved in 1986 and 1987. The failed businesses must have been stressful for the young family, ultimately leading to them losing it all, as Lou put it. Um, I, I, my young age, I was a, a pretty angry young man um, yeah. because of my, the, the situation my parents went through, fairly dysfunctional, unfortunately. We lost everything. This added stress was likely a contributing factor in the decision of Lou's parents to divorce in 1987. Lou was just over 15 years old. After the divorce in late 1988, Lou's father would go on to start two more solo businesses within two days of each other, called TIL and EDL Incorporated. Both of these businesses were registered in Imokali, Florida, and would finally afford the senior Elizondo a little bit of success, because TIL Inc. existed for five years and EDL Inc. lasted for nearly 16 years. 
These businesses will be mentioned again later, but for now, back to Sarasota, where it seems that Lou might have stayed with his mother after the breakup because he listed an address that was identical to hers when the two of them started a business together in the beginning of his senior year of high school in 1989 called Louis Devo Incorporated. Sadly, Lou's father's newfound business sense did not wear off on the junior Elizondo because Louis Devo Incorporated also failed the next year in 1990. Despite having a rocky childhood, having parents divorced during his teenaged years, and a failed business attempt, Lou managed to keep his life together and graduate from Riverview High School in 1990 and then go on to the next chapter of his life. College Who's Lou? Later, I attended the University of Miami with double majors in microbiology and immunology and minors in chemistry. I also gained advanced research experience in parasitology in certain tropical diseases such as malaria and trypanosomiasis. My goal with these degrees was to enter the medical field. During my research experience, I was tangentially exposed to government agencies that were interested in biological research and intelligence. It was at this point I decided to pursue a career in intelligence and realized my true passion. I also decided to enlist in the U.S. Army. Just like in his early years, there is significantly more to the story of Lou in college and his years leading into the Army than the official webpage suggests. On a recent livestream interview, Lou would describe his college years as slightly troubled as well. Yeah, that was my life, I'll tell you right now. I think, you know, I, uh, and... I think with age, hopefully comes experience and maturity. Um, I, I, my young age, I was a, a pretty angry young man um, yeah. because of my, the, the situation my parents went through, fairly dysfunctional, unfortunately. We lost everything. Um, and, uh, you know, I was I was thrust into this environment where every single day it was just, it was brutal, it was merciless. Um, and so as I got older, I, I learned that I wasn't very good on, on, you know, sports. I wasn't always, I was, you know, when you have... <laughs> You have PE time, right? And always that one last kid who's picked last. Well, that was me. I was a liability, whether it was football, baseball, basketball. I was just terrible. But the one thing I was good at was, uh, turned out, was fighting, Uh, whether it was boxing and wrestling and kickboxing. And so I found myself in these environments. When I got into college, I became a bouncer. And I told myself, I actually fooled myself, telling myself, well, I'm a bouncer at night because it's the only job I can find that pays me cash and it conforms to my my, my school schedule. But in reality, hindsight being 2020, I, I think I was in that situation because I wanted a chance to, 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 to really go after those bullies, right? Nothing, nothing I would wait for in a, in a, in a, in, in when I was at the club, um, was for some big bully guy to start picking on somebody. Man, mm-hmm. that was my favorite, man. Because yeah, I was, man, I was coming too. in, man. I, I would tell these guys, look, man, throttle in our heart. I'm here every day. I get paid to fight every single mm-hmm. day, man. And uh, nothing's going to bring me more joy than to, to, to tune your wagon up real good. According to the University of Miami Registrar's Office, Lou enrolled as a student in August of 1990. Not much is known about Lou's time in college except for this single newspaper article from Lou's sophomore year dated 1992 in the college newspaper The Miami Hurricane. The title of the article was Street Talk, What Do You Think About the Guarded Spring Break Parking Lot? In the article, a young and philosophical Elizondo is quoted as saying, students pay quite a bit of money to go here. You would think that there would be adequate parking, but since there usually isn't, this is a good idea. However Lou would go on to spend his time, he would then continue on to receive a bachelor's degree in 1994 with a double major in microbiology and immunology and a minor in chemistry. For some reason, it appears that Lou stayed enrolled in the university for a full year after receiving his degree. I can only assume that he took some additional classes in that year. 
Or maybe it's because he met a girl. Because in late 1995, Lou would also meet and begin to share a mailing address with Jennifer Powers, who would someday become his wife. Over the next two years, they would share addresses in Miami and Hope Sound, Florida together. Hope Sound is up in the Palm City, Jupiter area, and it was here in Hope Sound in 1996 when Mr. Luis Elizondo and Jennifer Powers gave birth to a healthy and beautiful baby daughter. It is also about this time that Lou joined the Army and went off for basic training. Who's Lou? During my short tenure in the U.S. Army, I had the honor and privilege to serve in various assignments. As a counterintelligence special agent, I was assigned to the Republic of Korea, South Korea, and later throughout America's Southwest. As a young agent, I conducted counter-espionage investigations, provided technology protection of advanced aerospace systems and platforms, supported the U.S.-Russia treaties, Open Skies and START II, and conducted routine security background investigations. Shortly thereafter, I was recruited into a special activities program with the Department of the Army. This led me to new assignments throughout Latin America and the Caribbean. As an intelligence operations officer, my responsibilities included oversight of sensitive source operations, counterinsurgency missions, and support to counter narcotics. Lou and Jennifer moved to Denver, Colorado in late 1996 or early 1997. During this time, I suspect that Lou was stationed in Denver after boot camp as the U.S. Army base in Denver was only a 26-minute drive from Lou and Jennifer's registered mailing address. It is unclear exactly how long the couple stayed in Denver together. In fact, they might have had to part ways for a little bit because at this point, Lou drops off the radar completely for three years or so from 1997 until 2000, while Jennifer continued to maintain the address in Denver and then later an address in Miami. But it wasn't until late 1999 or early 2000 that the couple would be reunited again. This time it was in Puerto Rico. In the public records, there is no obvious indication of whether or not Lou was in Puerto Rico the whole three years or if he was deployed somewhere else and met up with Jennifer again in Puerto Rico in 2000. Only Lou or the Department of Defense could tell us that. However, I did notice an apparent pattern in the moves of Lou and his wife that began in Puerto Rico in 2000. First, like most people, Lou seems to hate commuting, and the couple chose to live as close to where Lou was working as possible. And second, whenever the couple moved somewhere, one of them would normally move first to set things up, and the other would join them later, and they seldom moved together. For example, here in Puerto Rico, Lou was here for several months or even a couple years before Jen joined him briefly. Also, the mailing address for Lou and Jennifer in Puerto Rico was a 15-minute drive away from Fort Buchanan, leading me to believe that whatever Lou was doing was associated with the base. This pattern of living close to Lou's work location and of one of them moving before the other will continue through the rest of their moves. Fort Buchanan is a relatively mundane installation that seems to host training exercises for the Army and the National Guard. Fort Buchanan is most famously known for an annual open door event where anyone in the public can inspect the facilities. So whatever it was that Lou was doing down there in Puerto Rico, I doubt it was very exciting. In any case, Lou and Jennifer did not stay down in Puerto Rico for very long. Immediately following the aftermath of the attacks on September 11th, I spent the following years working alongside our brave men and women in uniform in Afghanistan and the Middle East. In these environments, I worked with the full spectrum of U.S. intelligence and law enforcement agencies, focusing our efforts along with special operations to identify and defeat terrorist organizations. In this environment, I was able to work within a multinational effort supporting the global war on terror. Just like Lou's childhood and college years, 
there is significantly more to the story of Lou Elizondo between 2001 and 2008 when he joined ATIP. While the biography from Luis Elizondo official during that time frame reads like some sort of super soldier intelligence agent fictional novel of the caliber of Ian Fleming, the public records of Lou Elizondo show a life that is much more ordinary and interesting. You see, even before September 11th of 2001, Lou had had a busy year. In February of 2001, Lou filed for the right to claim a patent for his first invention. And I have to admit that when I discovered that Lou was an inventor, I was very curious to see what sort of an invention that a guy with a double degree in microbiology and immunology and a minor in chemistry plus a few years of military experience could come up with. My curiosity quickly turned to confusion when I learned that Lou had filed with the U.S. Patent Office for a patent on something he had named the Hydromax Motorboat Propeller Deflection and Safety Shroud. So here we have what seems yet another contradiction. Here is a patent that one would expect a person with a marine engineering or a nautical science degree and perhaps an electrical engineering minor to have created not an army member with biology and immunology degrees. And so I have to ask this, how does someone with science degrees and a military background suddenly come up with nautical patents? There's also one more unanswered question about this patent. Is this even Lou's or his father's? The patent is listed on the link provided on LouisElizondoOfficial.com under his patent link, implying that the patent is Lou's. And ultimately, the patent would later be modified to clarify that it is indeed Lou's by listing his addresses. However, the address listed under the original patent filed in 2001 lists that the inventor of the patent resided at Lou's father's address in Imokali, Florida. And as they share the same name, I have to question if this patent was originally filed by Lou or his father. This makes me strongly question if this was an honest mistake or if there was some alternative reason to originally file Lou's patent under his father's name and address and then transfer it to Lou later. I guess that these are just a few more of the unanswered questions and contradictions that arise when we ask, who's Lou? Two thousand and one was not just a creative year for Lou. It was also a big stepping stone in his personal family life. In April of two thousand and one, Lou and Jennifer would purchase their first family home together in Grovetown, Georgia. This house would be located a mere thirteen-minute drive from Fort Gordon. I have no idea as to what Lou's job was at Fort Gordon but it stands to reason that he was doing something there with signal operations and intelligence. However, the way Lou tells the story, after 9-11, he, quote, spent the following years working alongside our brave men and women in uniform in Afghanistan and the Middle East, end quote, a truly noble, heroic, and patriotic endeavor. However, just like before, the public records show a life that is much more common, You see, there is no record whatsoever that Lou was ever stationed or deployed anywhere abroad. I could find no documentation to support this insinuation. The only piece of evidence that Lou Elizondo ever stepped foot in the Middle East is this single photo from LuisElizondoOfficial.com of Lou standing in front of what appears to be Kandahar Airport in Afghanistan. So, if Lou was indeed working alongside our soldiers, I believe he was doing it remotely, perhaps even behind a desk. And remember that picture, because we're going to be talking about it again later, but for now, we'll move on. While searching the public records, I discovered that from 2001 through most of 2003, both Jennifer and Lou maintained mailing addresses at the family homestead in Georgia. However, it appears that Lou also maintained a second solo mailing address in Palm City, Florida. It also appears that Lou may have shared this address with someone who is clearly not his wife, as the co-occupant listed at the time is significantly younger than Jennifer and has a different name. And so one has to question, 
What was Lou doing in Florida during this time in the Palm City area, living with the woman who is not his wife? Was this something work-related or something personal? In an attempt to answer that question, I performed a search of the area and could find no nearby military bases or installations. So it is unclear why Lou would have had a separate mailing address in Florida during this time, as if he were deployed legitimately through his position in the army, he shouldn't need one. Additionally, I performed a reverse address search on the address Lou used while in Palm City. I discovered that a person named Larry Powers had resided at this address as well. As Powers is Lou's wife Jennifer's maiden name, I wondered if there was any family connection between Jennifer and this Larry Powers. A web search for Larry Powers in the Palm City, Florida area revealed an obituary dated 2015. Larry seems to have been a very well-respected, loved, and missed person who touched many lives in a positive way. Larry enjoyed boating and his family time. He was a longtime resident of the Jupiter, Florida area, and Larry was also a longtime employee of Lockheed Martin Industries, working for 26 years in some form of satellite engineering and project management positions. Jupiter, Palm City, and Hope Sound, Florida are all within about a 20-minute drive of one another. And I would also like to point out that Lou and his wife have ties to this area, as they had both resided in Hope Sound previously when they gave birth to their daughter back in 1996. And while I mentioned that there are no nearby military installations that I could find in the area, a search of LockheedMartinJobs.com shows many jobs in the Palm City, Jupiter area of Florida. So I think it is safe to assume that there is a strong defense industry presence in this area of Florida. However, after an exhaustive search of internet archives, I was unable to locate any birth records for Miss Jennifer Powers Elizondo, and as such could neither confirm nor exclude any direct relationship with Larry Powers, the longtime Lockheed Martin employee. I should also mention at this point that during the course of this investigation, I was unable to locate a marriage certificate for Lou and Jennifer Elizondo as well. And as none of the states that they have resided in have common law marriage laws in place, I have to question if these two are even legally married. It seems a trivial point. However, it makes me wonder why two people would represent themselves to the world as man and wife when it appears that they are not. And just to be perfectly clear, all of these facts might be purely coincidental or explained in a rational way. However, in the scope of this documentary, I felt that they had to be mentioned because this won't be the last time that the name of the Lockheed Martin Corporation pops up during the delve into the question of who's Lou? This brings us to March of 2004 when Lou and his wife packed their bags and they sold the family home in Georgia and moved to Stevensville, Maryland. Stevensville is a suburban part of Maryland on Kent Island. It is located less than a 45 minute drive away from both Baltimore and Washington, D.C. For the next two years, Lou and Jennifer would rent a house in Stevensville before buying a permanent residence in 2006. The Pentagon and ATIP. After several assignments in the Middle East, I was assigned to Washington, D.C. as the Overseas Investigations Desk Officer. There, I had the responsibility of managing foreign intelligence and terrorist investigations worldwide. Over the next several years, I worked within a variety of intelligence agencies and organizations. It is unclear exactly what Lou was doing during this time at the Pentagon. However, Lou described it on his webpage as working as an overseas investigations desk officer. In this bureaucratic role at the Pentagon, Lou vaguely states that he worked within a variety of intelligence agencies and organizations. 
However, just like in the case of Lou's previous Army experience, the only verifiable information that I could find about his career up to this point was his own statement on his official webpage and the single accompanying photo that Lou had titled Korea One. There is zero verifiable evidence to support Lou's statement here beyond his own words and a photo that he has provided. Just like every other portrayal of Lou's life, the source is Lou Elizondo himself. So here we have yet another unanswered question. Is this all true or is it simply an embellished war story? Who's Lou? In 2007, Lou apparently was feeling creative again, and he would file for another patent with the U.S. Patent Office. This time, the science major applied for another nautical patent. This one was titled, Interchangeable Superstructures and Hulls for Ocean-Going Vessels. It is clear that this patent belongs to Lou and not his father as it lists his Stevensville address. The patent is for an interchangeable ship hull on a commercial transport vessel. This patent has a long and complicated history and will keep popping up again later in Lou's life. And I will be mentioning it again later, so keep this patent for an interchangeable boat hull in mind and we will move along to 2008. In 2008, I was asked to be part of the now famous Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, ATIP. In 2010, as a staff member for the Office of the Secretary of Defense, I assumed the lead role for this endeavor. Our mission was to conduct scientific-based intelligence investigations of incursions by unidentified aerial phenomenon into controlled U.S. airspace. In 2008, according to Liu, he was asked to join the now infamous ATIP program at the Pentagon. There would be much speculation, opinion, questions, investigation, and obfuscation surrounding the exact nature of the ATIP program and of Lou's involvement in it over the years. In fact, it is still a matter of debate to this day. I'm not going to be spending too much time talking about the program here as that could be a whole documentary of its own. However, there are a few points worth mentioning. After Lou left the Department of Defense and joined TTSA in late 2017, the mainstream media largely characterized Lou as the Pentagon's UFO man. Until he stepped out on stage last now, October alongside rock star event, Tom DeLonge and other former the government essence, insiders, most of the world had never heard of Luis Elizondo, which is how he liked it. Elizondo's government career was spent in the shadows, mostly as a Pentagon intelligence officer. I was at the top of my game in my career field, and I left it all to have this conversation with the American public. There the conversation is about UFOs. For almost 10 years, Again, Elizondo was a central a figure in a secret Pentagon program to study unknown aerial threats. These days, he's preparing to relocate to the sleepy beach town of Encinitas, which is where Tom DeLonge's To The Stars Academy is based. That organization made public a pair of UFO videos which Elizondo helped to declassify before he left Washington. If you Google the term ATIP, you will see that there are thousands of news articles about the program. Most of these articles refer to Lou as the Pentagon's UFO top dog or the Pentagon UFO whistleblower. However, you will notice that the vast majority of these articles are sourced solely on statements made by Lou himself or point back to the original TTSA press release. Hello, I'm Tom DeLong, and thanks for joining us live today. Or George Knapp's article and broadcast later that day, with zero supporting evidence of fact. All of these articles pass the research and verification aspect of this story on to the original authors, TTSA 
and Lou Elizondo in some sort of strange journalistic version of passing the research buck in a circle while perpetuating a UFO whistleblower narrative, which all came back to Lou Elizondo and his word. Known as UFOs. What about those UFO videos? Well, remember the UFO videos? UFOs, unknown technology. UFO study. UFOs, UFO videos, UFO incidents. The UFO, two dozen UFO videos. Official UFO videos. UFO, UFO, UFO encounters, other UFOs. Oh, it's always so fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, George. I have spent the last few years looking for official documents pertaining to ATIP and what its function was. However, I have found very little. Here is most of what I've been able to locate. The first piece that we have are the leaked ATIP slides that were located on Christopher Mellon's official website. After these slides were discovered and revealed to the public, they were promptly removed from Mellon's official webpage, but not before copies were made. These slides describe the ATIP program in detail. The purpose of ATIP is described as a reporting program that would observe a certain issue and report an assessment of status and recommendations for that particular situation. These sorts of reporting programs are fairly common inside the military structure to give a high-ranking official a quick overview, analysis, and possible solution for any given situation or issue. For example, such reporting groups could be tasked with identifying and making recommendations on a myriad of military topics ranging from supply chain issues to personnel restructuring. The issue at hand that ATIP was tasked with is described here under its mission, to further identify, understand, and take advantage of a generation of highly advanced technologies and principles that may be currently employed by other countries, actors, or entities, and use this technology to the benefit of the department and provide the United States with a decisive advantage over adversaries and threats. The last part of this statement clearly means that whatever technology was identified by ATIP would be evaluated as to its military application value. So let's look at the first part of this mission statement. Quote, to further identify, understand, and take advantage of highly advanced technologies and principles that may be currently employed by other countries, actors, or entities. End quote. You will notice there is nothing about UFOs or flying saucers, nothing about aliens or alien technologies, nothing about off-world craft, and nothing about UAP. However, there is something about other countries, actors, or entities, which leads me to conclude that ATIP was most likely not a UFO or UAP program at all, but was a program to study the potential advanced top-secret technologies possessed by foreign countries that may become an adversary, such as China or Russia. TTSA also released a near 30-minute video called Lou Elizondo Presents ATIP. In this entire video, Lou never once mentions the word UFO and only says UAP one time here in this clip. So let's go into a little bit about what ATIP is. ATIP evolved from OSAP. That is absolutely true. OSAP existed for a short period of time under another director to focus on the UAP-specific capabilities and concentrated on the what and how interrogatives. Not the who, not the when, but what is it and how does it work. That's it. In the context of that clip, Lou was talking about objects that might have unknown flight characteristics and what those UAP properties might be which makes perfect sense if ATIP was about tracking foreign countries' advanced weapons programs, but makes no sense if ATIP was about studying UFOs and UAP. The only reason that I mention all of this in this documentary is because to this day, despite the volume of evidence supporting the fact that ATIP was a foreign threat assessment program and not a UFO program, 
People all over the world continue to believe and to cite as fact the media news spectacle that ensued later when Mr. Elizondo would leave the Pentagon and join TTSA. Well, remember the UFO videos released by the Pentagon? It was late last year. Apparently, there are still more lurking in the military files. In fact, a man who spent 10 years working on the government's secret study of UFOs. Elizondo spent 10 years as head of a secret study of unidentified aerial objects. A secret Pentagon program to study unknown aerial objects, otherwise known as UFOs. What about those UFO videos? All of this truly makes me wonder what the ATIP program was actually about and what it was not. I guess we'll have to add this to the list of unanswered questions that arise when we ask, who's Lou? In addition to the leaked ATIP slides, I also found this redacted list of ATIP members in 2009 that shows Lou and one other DoD employee answered to the director of ATIP at the time, along with eight levels of bureaucrats ending in the Secretary of Defense. The document also shows that ATIP consisted of the director, Lou, and one other unidentified government employee. There's also a list at the bottom of three named contractors, two of which were redacted, and the last name being Dr. Hal Putoff of Bigelow Aerospace Advanced Space Studies, or BASS. So this clearly shows that ATIP was a small office somewhere in the Pentagon that consisted of only two to three people and a few contractors. And Lou's involvement was only from the years of 2008 to 2012, two years as a junior member and two years as the director of ATIP. This program was clearly not some massive, top secret UFO program as it was portrayed in the media. In fact, a man who spent 10 years working on the government's secret study of UFOs. Elizondo spent 10 years as head of a secret study of unidentified aerial objects, UFOs. Oh, it's always so fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, George. Here's another piece of concrete evidence that I discovered. A 2009 letter from Senator Harry Reid about a tip that indicates that the program was not about UFOs or UAP, but was instead mandated to, quote, assess far-term foreign advanced aerospace threats to the United States, end quote. This again suggests that the program was about monitoring advanced foreign aerospace threats. You will notice that the letter from Senator Reid makes no mention of aliens, alien life, or an alien threat. The document says nothing about monitoring advanced outer space threats, while it does mention monitoring advanced aerospace threats. This is a very important point, because as I mentioned earlier, ATIP was characterized in the mainstream media as a Pentagon UFO program. Well, remember the UFO videos? UFOs, unknown technology. UFO study. UFOs, UFO videos, UFO incidents. The UFO, two dozen UFO videos are being declassified for release to the public in the coming months. While it appears that, ATIP seems to have been mandated to be a program to investigate foreign countries' advanced technologies. And the whole time, Lou allowed it to be misportrayed in the media as such, when there is zero evidence to support the claim that ATIP was anything more than what it appears on paper, a foreign technology study. And what was it that Lou said before? So let's go into a little bit about what ATIP is. ATIP evolved from OSAP to focus on the UAP specific capabilities and concentrated on the what and how interrogatives. Not the who, not the when, but what is it and how does it work? That's it. I find it hard to believe that if ATIP were indeed a UFO investigation study, the U.S. military would not be extremely interested in finding out where these so-called UFOs were coming from. So this further supports the theory that ATIP was indeed about foreign advanced threats and if the technology that they possessed could be employed by the U.S. military, and that ATIP was not about UFOs. There is one final point to mention before we move on past ATIP, and that is that due to the controversy surrounding Lou's role in the program and precisely what the program entailed, in 2021, former Senator Harry Reid, who originally sponsored the ATIP program, released a document to the press. 
This statement was extremely vague and seemed to only confirm that some unnamed program that would later be called ATIP had a budget of what appears to be $22 million, and Mr. Lou Elizondo had served in the program for an undisclosed amount of time in a role of leadership. I am a little suspect of Mr. Reed's statements here for several reasons, such as the Senator's long involvement with the ATIP program, the fact that the Senator was retired and held no official position with the U.S. government at the time of the writing, and the fact that the Senator faced zero liability if this statement was found to be untrue. However, you will have to determine for yourself how credible this letter is with zero supporting evidence. That is all of the factual evidence that I could dig up on ATIP. Everything else was sourced back to Lou Elizondo himself or sourced back to other reporters who were sourced back to Lou. Such pieces are opinionated in nature while lacking supporting factual evidence and as such cannot be counted on for any form of truth. And that is all of the information that I have about ATIP. If you want an in-depth review of the ATIP program and its predecessor, OSAP, John Greenwald at the Black Vault has been vigorously following the story from day one and recently did a very articulate and thorough review of the whole program. I would recommend that you watch it as it will explain the whole issue in detail. Outside of his job at the Pentagon, not much is known about Lou's personal life during this time frame. We do know from public filings that in 2010, Lou's wife Jennifer had to file Chapter 13 bankruptcy for some reason. As mentioned previously, an exhaustive nationwide search of marriage records failed to reveal a marriage certificate for Lou and Jen, and so it is unknown if Lou was personally affected by the bankruptcy. However, it does appear from the property records on the family home in Stevensville, which was in both Lou and Jen's name at the time, that they were fortunately able to keep their home separated from the bankruptcy as they would not sell that property until several years later. Shortly before the bankruptcy, Lou would again try his hand as an inventor and a businessman. In the newspaper archives, I was able to locate an article that appeared in January 2010 describing a business venture that Lou had started with a friend of his by the name of John Robert. The article describes how Lou and Mr. Robert had been pals since meeting in the Army in 1996. Mr. Robert moved to Kent Island in 2005 a year after Lou did and the two commuted to work together across the Bay Bridge from Kent Island into mainland Maryland. Every day on the way to work, they would see ships lying at anchor, and they wanted to come up with the process for ships to have a faster turnaround time as they landed in port and waited for paperwork to clear inspections for damage before finally being allowed to dock and unload. And so, apparently, this gave them an idea to start a company called Never Ship Empty Incorporated. In the article, they show a Never Ship Empty logo and they state that the company is in talks with the Port of Baltimore in order to discuss the port signing on as the initial test port. And all of this right in the middle of Lou's ATIP work and the year he was promoted to director of ATIP. He found the time to start a business with another desk agent who he commuted with. However, just like all of Lou's stories, there's just one small problem. The business that Lou told this journalist existed, Never Ship Empty Incorporated, would have been more appropriately called Never Existed Incorporated, because a state-specific search at the Maryland Secretary of State LLC Entity Lookup showed no such entity has ever existed in the state of Maryland. An additional nationwide business search in the name of Never Ship Empty Incorporated and of John Robert, John Robert's full birth name, Lou Elizondo and his full birth name, all failed to show a business named Never Ship Empty Incorporated in any state. Never Ship Empty Incorporated simply never existed. Who's Lou? 
The article also mentions a patent that Lou and his partner had received. However, I was unable to find a patent for Never Ship Empty at the patent office in 2010. And so just like Lou's company, the patent also did not exist. I did, however, discover that during this time, Lou was modifying his interchangeable boat hull patent and resubmitting it to the patent office. And he was then issued a patent in February of 2009. You will notice again on this patent that Lou is listed as the sole inventor. And note that this patent was issued several months before the Never Ship Empty article was printed. So this makes me wonder, how is this article printed, fact-checked, and passed by a newspaper editor when the main facts of the story, the company, and the patent appear to have never existed? How can Lou explain telling the writer of this article that a company and a patent existed when there is no record of them? Was anything in this article factual? Was this all just another get-rich-quick scheme with no real-world application? Or was it a sincere business venture made by a man who was allegedly the Pentagon's UFO hunter at the time? I guess these are just a few more of the unanswered questions that arise when we ask, Who's Lou? Elsewhere in the world in 2011, Lou's mother Janice would sadly pass away. And over in Imokali, Florida, later that year, it seems that Lou's father would come into some money because he would pay off his mortgages in full, and then he sold off three parcels of land to a nonprofit organization. The three lots appear to be a parking lot that is across the street from the building owned by the NPO, so I presume the lots were rented to the NPO before this. But in 2012, Lou's father would sell one of his sources of income to this nonprofit organization for the sum of $10. And I have to question as to why anyone would sell a property to a nonprofit organization for $10. Why not sell the property for the tax assessed value? That way you can claim the donation as a tax write off. This makes no sense unless you are not worried about tax write offs which implies that you are financially secure. I did, however, find that Lou Sr. had actually purchased the lots originally from someone for a sum of $10 as well. So I think that maybe in the past, somebody did Lou Sr. a favor and sold them these properties for cheap. And that by selling the properties to the NPO for $10, perhaps Lou Sr. was paying back the favor. Or maybe not. I don't know. But what I do know is that Lou's father sold off a revenue stream for next to nothing, and people simply don't do that unless they can afford to. It might just be a coincidence, or it might not, as it is unclear exactly where the money came from. However, in the context of this documentary, I felt that it was important to include this information. Meanwhile, Back in Maryland, according to Lou, sometime in 2010, he was promoted to the director position of ATIP, where he would remain for the next two years until 2012, when ATIP was officially ended. Even the ending of the ATIP program would not distract Lou from his goal of becoming a successful inventor. It appears that in that same year as ATIP was ending, Lou was modifying his patent for his interchangeable boat hole once again. This whole ordeal was a long and complicated process spanning over six years and required refiling and modifying the patent four separate times. This final version of the patent looked much the same as all the rest he had filed over the years, except for one small but extremely significant detail. In this version of Lou's patent, there was a long list of nautical patents that were referenced in the filing. The first patent listed was issued back in 2007 to a Terence Schmidt, who was a master shipbuilder employed by Lockheed Martin at the time. Currently, Mr. Schmidt is the co-owner in a private company called Enmar Technologies that makes boats and aquatic features that employ declassified versions of Lockheed Martin technology. 
A biography on Mr. Schmidt from the Inmar Technologies webpage shows that he was employed by Lockheed Martin for 31 years where he received 14 patents. Mr. Schmidt holds a Bachelor's of Science degree in Aeronautical Engineering and a Master's degree in Mechanical Engineering and conducted wind tunnel testing at NASA for six years. Mr. Schmidt is exactly the sort of person that you would expect to design a nautical patent. He has the credentials for it, he has the experience for it, and he has the knowledge for it. And I would just like to point out a couple of things here. First, Lou Elizondo received a single bachelor's degree with a double major in microbiology and immunology from Miami University in 1995. Additionally, this patent was originally filed in 2006, not long before Lou was assigned to ATIP. Now let me ask this, how does a guy with a science degree come up with these nautical patents that Lou is claiming as inventor? And why did Lou reference a 2007 patent given to Lockheed Martin in his patent filing? And why did all of this happen right about or before the time that Lou joined ATIP? Is it all simply coincidence? Because to me, all of this circumstantial evidence certainly gives the appearance that Lou had some sort of involvement with Lockheed Martin engineers as early as 2007 and continuing until at least 2012. Why else would he be citing Lockheed Martin patents in his own patent applications? And this makes me wonder, did Lou meet some sort of a Lockheed Martin representative in 2007 or before who helped coach him on nautical patents so that they could pay to use those patents in some form of what the Uniform Code of Military Justice under Article 124B defines as a graft? This is a very serious and extremely alarming unanswered question that has come up when we ask, who's Lou? During the course of this investigation, I reached out for a comment to Mr. Schmidt who was listed in the 2007 Lockheed Martin patent. Mr. Schmidt failed to respond to my request. And that brings us to 2014, two years after ATIP has ended, and over four years after the Never Ship Empty article was printed describing the non-existent company that Lou and John Robert allegedly formed. Lou had finalized his interchangeable boat hole patent and in the process added John Robert and John's brother Atmar as second and third co-inventors. I have no idea why Lou would add a second and third party to his patent as co-inventors at this point, nor could I speculate as to why he waited over four years to file a patent with the co-founder of a non-existent company called Never Ship Empty Incorporated. Nor could I tell you how Lou found time to do all of this while he was working full-time at the Pentagon. Add all of these to the list of unanswered questions that we get when we ask, Who's Lou? After ATIP was shut down, we don't know exactly what Lou was doing for the Department of Defense officially. There were rumors about work at Guantanamo Bay, which led John Greenwald at the Black Vault to ask Lou this. You know, you do have those security oaths and NDAs and, and, and clearances where you can't talk about it. And that was what was very evident to me about that office, because there was very little to dig up. And trust me, I've tried since 2000, whatever it was. When that, that, I uh, have no doubt, John. Yeah. I have no uh, doubt. But it was those Navy court transcripts that came up. And, and I won't push you on it because I know it is sensitive and I know it's still ongoing. But for Khalid Sheikh Mohammed to reference your office in October of 2017, uh, it's clear that whatever you were doing within that office was in uh, dealing with special access programs and also giving what appeared from the transcripts, the translator for Khalid Sheikh Mohammed access to the information for him to properly translate to, for the defense. And there was a problem with the judge because they had lost their SAP access. So for me to see that again, away from the ATIP story, that made me realize a couple years ago, okay, this guy was into you know, some, some highly classified 
uh, material programs and obviously the one that was spearheading that effort for others to gain access to those special access uh, programs. Well, that, that's honestly, John, what landed me on the naughty boy list with, with ISIS and Al-Qaeda, uh, that I was informed that I, I, uh, I was wound up being put on the on the kill list, uh, which was not a very good day in the Elizondo house, hold, I can, I can assure you. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, fortunately for me, just I just wound up on being on some sort of, of kill list where other people actually, you know, lost their lives. So yeah. I, I'm, I'm definitely not saying that that the line of work was was you know uh, anything more dangerous than anybody else but it did put me in a situation where uh it um it 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 it, it may it still is technically i'm still you know on on that that uh, naughty list if yeah. you will uh there is zero evidence to support Lou's allegation that he was or currently is on some sort of a hit list, at least that I was able to uncover. But then again, terrorist organizations do not necessarily keep a wanted list like the FBI does on a website. However, he was a career intelligence officer up until that point with some form of a security clearance, so I don't find it too difficult to believe that he may have been sent on an assignment to Guantanamo Bay Prison. It seems logical as he was cleared for such a high-level intelligence operation and Lou's role at the Special Access Program Management Staff would have most likely given him time for such a side assignment. We just have no way of knowing for sure unless there is some documentation to support his claims. However, I do find the claim questionable as Lou would state publicly on live streams, what state he was living in. I gotta, if, if you know, if, if I get pissed off enough, man. You know, last thing I want to do is is get back into the fray of things. I need that like a hole in the head. I just want to be left alone and retire. There's a reason why I live in the middle of nowhere, Wyoming. And a simple search of the internet would reveal Lou's current address. So I have to seriously doubt if Mr. Elizondo was ever on any sort of a hit list or if this is just another one of his grandiose war stories. Well, that, that's honestly, John, what landed me on the naughty boy list with, with ISIS and Al-Qaeda. I guess we'll just have to add this one to the long list of unanswered questions that arise when we ask, who's Lou? In 2017, with a heavy heart, I resigned from my position inside the Pentagon in an effort to raise awareness of the UAP issue. The decision to resign was based on my sense of loyalty to the secretary and my beloved department. In order to dismantle the bureaucratic silos and stovepipes hindering the conversation about this important topic. October 4th, 2017. Lou Elizondo tendered his resignation from the Department of Defense. Lou cited a myriad of vague, unsubstantiated allegations at the Pentagon as the cause and then quit. One week later, on October 11, 2017, Lou was on the stage with Tom DeLonge in Seattle, Washington. They stood on a stage in an empty auditorium and issued a statement in a staged press conference that included exactly zero press members and was televised to the world. Listen to this clip and notice that you can hear every sound in the auditorium indicating that it is empty. And pay attention to how Lou looks around while he is speaking as if the room is full of journalists that he is speaking to, when in reality, this was an empty room. Hello, I'm Tom DeLong, and thanks for joining us live today. Um, you know, I want to take a second here. Months ago, I had some very important people uh, from inside the government talking about somebody um, that one day I would possibly be able to meet. And I, I remember the words were, uh, it, you, you can't know his name, but if you were ever to know his name, you would have to keep that to yourself till the day you die. And then uh, I remember there was a big breakthrough where we started referring to this guy by the letter L. Days ago, days ago, this person finished his career at the Department of Defense as one of the senior covert intelligence officers in the office of the Secretary of Defense. Um, I think you need to really listen carefully to what he says. And I, I still even 
working our way up to today, I, I get the chills when you, when, you, when you say it. So I want you to all meet Lou Elizondo. Well, thanks, Tom, for that very um, special introduction. My name is Lou Elizondo, and as a career intelligence officer, I am accustomed to being involved in close hold, nuanced programs involving national security. This includes being a counterintelligence special agent, a case officer, and an intelligence practitioner. However, by far the most interesting effort I was involved with was the topic of advanced aerial threats. For nearly the last decade, I ran a sensitive aerospace threat identification program focusing on unidentified aerial technologies. It was in this position I learned that the phenomena is indeed real. This truly makes me wonder if TTSA had something to fear by answering questions about the claims made in such an uncontrolled setting. However, I could only speculate why anyone would schedule such a staged press event. I guess you would have to ask Tom DeLong why they failed to invite a single member of the press to the so-called press release. And here we have just one more contradiction that surrounds the question of who's Lou? But before we talk about the TTSA, we need to talk about exactly how and when Lou resigned from the military, and exactly what he was up to in the final months leading up to his resignation. There are some very important details that we need to cover. Listen to this clip where Lou is talking with John Greenwald about when he first left the Pentagon and joined TTSA in October 2017. As far as uh, meeting Tom DeLong, it wasn't until afterwards. Actually, once I resigned is when um, I was approached to say, hey, Lou, you know, there's this little organization over here led by some guy, some some rock star, which by we met now, don't hold me to it, but I mean, we're going back three years now. Sure. I'm pretty certain it was Jim who, who actually was the one to offer me a, a, a position. Uh, Pre-resignation or, or post, just for chronological? No, post, post. Post, no, gotcha. Post. I got you. Lou has publicly stated that he had never heard of or met Tom DeLong, and that he had not been extended an opportunity to work with TTSA before he resigned from the Pentagon. However, I find that extremely hard to believe for a few reasons. First, Tom DeLong admitted himself that he and his colleagues at TTSA had been discussing Lou Elizondo for months before he joined the company. Um, you know, I want to take a second here. Months ago, I had some very important people uh, from inside the government talking about somebody um, that one day I would possibly be able to meet. Additionally, in early 2017, Tom DeLong teased the upcoming TTSA release while he was receiving an award from Open Minds TV. Yeah. And uh, I'm making really good progress. I can't tell you what I'm about to announce. If you look at my social media, uh, at least on my Instagram, you'll see that I said there's going to be announcement, an announcement in like um, within the next 60-ish days. And here is one more alarming and contradictory fact. Public records for Lou's wife showed that Jennifer P. Elizondo rented an apartment in Encinitas, California that was a six-minute drive from the TTSA headquarters and that she had rented this apartment sometime in 2016, at least 11 months before Lou retired from the Pentagon. This seems to follow the Elizondo's pattern of living near Lou's workspace and one member of the household moving to set up a new home before the other joins them later. And it also seems to indicate Lou's prior intentions to join the TTSA almost a year before he quit the Pentagon, as there is simply no other logical explanation for his wife moving so close to the TTSA headquarters almost a year before Lou left the Pentagon. Another fact that seems to indicate that Lou was planning the move to TTSA before leaving the Pentagon 
is this document dated April 26, 2017, almost six months before Lou retired from the Pentagon. This document shows that Lou had sold the family home in Stevensville in preparation for his resignation from the Department of Defense and him joining the TTSA. And here are two more significant facts that imply that Lou might have been associated with TTSA before his resignation. On August 15, 2017, over in California, just 10 minutes away from where Lou's wife Jennifer was living, Tom DeLong of To The Stars Academy filed with the SEC to take his company public. The public venture move was estimated to bring in 20 to $30 million in revenue for the company to invest in its research and development. And just nine days later, over at the Pentagon, on August 24, 2017, four months after he had sold the family home in Stevensville, and just over a month before Lou would resign from the Department of Defense, Lou filed this request to have three pieces of video footage declassified. There are some very important points to note about this request. First, Lou told the Pentagon that the footage was of unmanned aerial vehicles, balloons, and other unmanned aerial systems. The footage is clearly not of UFOs, aliens, UAP, spaceships, flying saucers, or swamp gas. He clearly states that the videos are of drones, balloons, and other UAS. Second, Lou told the Pentagon that the videos were not for publication and were for research and analysis only with other U.S. government and industry partners for the purpose of developing an identification database. And the final point, all of this was going on in 2017, five years after ATIP had officially ended, during which time Lou had other assigned duties at the Pentagon. There is no legitimate reason Lou would have had to request the three pieces of footage being declassified at the time that he did. This seriously casts doubts on Lou's motivations, as it suggests that Mr. Elizondo abused his authority and tenure at the DOD to secure the declassification of the videos shortly before his resignation. At some point after this, we know that the footage was indeed declassified and that it was leaked to the public illegally and ended up in the hands of Tom DeLong and to the Stars Academy of Arts and Sciences, where, coincidentally, Lou was also employed after leaving the Pentagon. And so I have to ask these questions. If Lou was not collaborating with TTSA and planning to leave the Pentagon for at least 11 months, how can he explain his wife moving to California 10 minutes away from the TTSA headquarters almost a year before he quit? How can Lou explain the hype and promotion by Tom DeLong in March of 2017, some nine months before Lou quit the DoD? Serious shit. How can Lou explain selling his family home of 13 years over five months before he quit the Pentagon? How can Lou explain the obvious financial motivation that it appears he was granted by the TTSA stock offering and by his facilitating the leak of the Gimbal, FLIR, and GoFast videos? And finally, how can Lou explain filing to have three pieces of video footage declassified just over a month before his resignation, and those same three pieces of video ending up over at TTSA along with Lou Elizondo himself right after the company began selling a bunch of stocks? All of these will have to be added to the list of unanswered questions and contradictions that arise when we ask, Who's Lou? After selling the family home of over a decade, while Jennifer was off in California, Lou would continue to rent a house just down the street where he would reside the last few months until his official resignation. After resigning at the Pentagon, Lou joined his wife in Encinitas, California, and that brings us to October 14, 2017, and the staged TTSA press event in Seattle, Washington, held in an empty auditorium. It was exactly seven days after Lou's resignation from the Pentagon, and he had officially been employed by TTSA at this time. Hello, I'm Tom DeLong, and thanks for joining us live today. It was in this position 
I learned that the phenomena is indeed real. Within hours of the TTSA event in Seattle, KLAS I-Team investigator George Knapp broke the story online and would begin the narrative of A-Tip being about UFOs. Until he stepped out on stage last now, October alongside the rock star event, Tom DeLonge and other former the government essence, insiders, most of the world had never heard of Luis Elizondo, which is how he liked it. Elizondo's government career was spent in the shadows, mostly as a Pentagon intelligence officer. I was at the top of my game in my career field, and I left it all to have this conversation with the American public. There the conversation is about UFOs. For almost 10 years, Again, Elizondo was a central a figure in a secret Pentagon program to study unknown aerial threats. These days, he's preparing to relocate to the sleepy beach town of Encinitas, which is where Tom DeLonge's To The Stars Academy is based. That organization made public a pair of UFO videos which Elizondo helped to declassify before he left Washington. George also wrote an online news article that was clearly an, an op-ed piece and is heavily opinionated about Lou's role in ATIP and what ATIP was. By using the term UFO in the article over a dozen times, Knapp opened the door for the mainstream media to begin its UFO blitz. Well, remember the UFO videos? UFOs, unknown technology. UFO study. UFOs, UFO videos, UFO incidents. The UFO, two dozen UFO videos are being declassified for release to the public in the coming months. George Knapp had sparked an online media surge reinforcing the UFO narrative to the public. This one-sided narrative would overwhelm the few people who questioned Lou's dubious claims in an epic wave of propaganda. Many have wondered why Mr. Knapp was so quick to characterize the ATIP program as a UFO program and have been suspicious of the nature of his relationship with TTSA. As Mr. Knapp had previously published several interviews with Tom DeLong prior to Lou joining the company in 2017. It would later be revealed that Mr. Knapp had purchased a small quantity of stock in TTSA, while failing to disclose this apparent conflict of interest to the public, calling into question Mr. Knapp's objectivity in his reporting of a company in which he owned stock. And so I guess Mr. Knapp's involvement with TTSA is just going to be another one of the unanswered questions that arises when we ask, who's Lou? Outside of TTSA, in 2018, Lou joined the cast of the History Channel's Unidentified. This move would begin Lou's journey to celebrity status, a status that he enjoys to this day. Seemingly by coincidence, right about this time is where things would finally take off for Lou and his family financially. However, it is unclear exactly where his newfound wealth came from. Some people postulate that the History Channel contract was the source of all the money. Other people speculate that Lou was one of the people in the huge TTSA payday scandal that amounted in the company having a $37.4 million deficit, largely due to its stock incentive program for its employees, of which Lou was one at the time. We really have no way of knowing where the money came from in 2018, but if we take a look at the public records, we can get some kind of an idea about how much money it was. In 2018, Lou and his wife would go on to purchase a couple of new properties. The first in West Virginia appears to be a nice little place in the country, valued at about $170,000. It is unknown if the property was purchased outright with cash or on a mortgage. Only Lou could answer that. But there is something strange about this property purchase that I noticed as well. It's unclear exactly when Lou and his wife purchased this property. The sales history shows that the transaction took place on December 14, 2016, 11 months before Lou left the Pentagon and right about the same time that Jennifer moved to Encinitas to be near the TTSA headquarters. 
But the parcel history shows that the old owners actually paid the 2017 taxes, but it looks like they used Lou and Jennifer's old address in Stevensville, Maryland as a mailing address. And during that time, you can also see that the improvement value for the home grew by close to $100,000 as well between 2016 and 2018. So it also appears that there were improvements made to this property during that time and a real estate wealth gain of $100,000. Why someone would do all of this is beyond me. Perhaps it was to avoid detection of the purchase of this property and the improvements as some sort of a tax scam. Or perhaps it was just a simple bookkeeping error. Either way, as it appears that Mr. and Mrs. Elizondo may have purchased a property and paid the taxes on it while keeping it listed in the old owner's name, I really have to question the legality of such an action. And so I have to ask, when exactly did Lou and his wife purchase this West Virginia home and for how much? And if it was before he left the Pentagon, how did they pay for this property and the improvements? I guess we'll just have to add all these to the list of unanswered questions and contradictions that arise when we ask, Who's Lou? The house in West Virginia was not the only property that the Elizondos purchased in 2018. In September, Lou and Jen also bought a piece of land in Ramona, California. The sale price was just under $800,000, and you can tell by the amount of the VA loan on the home that Lou and Jen put approximately 10% down or roughly $80,000 cash. What exactly Lou was doing in Ramona is anyone's guess, but I can only assume that from September 2018 on, Mr. Elizondo was having problems with Tom DeLong and the others over at To The Stars Academy. And just like when Lou left the Pentagon, his exit strategy was already planned and implemented before his partner even knew there was trouble. At this point in time, Lou was still officially a part of the TTSA, but it also appears that he had some form of business in the San Diego area, as the Ramona address is about a half an hour drive from the city. The question is, what business could Lou Elizondo have in San Diego in late 2018? San Diego is full of military installations and DOD contractors and support businesses and facilities. However, Elizondo was no longer employed by the U.S. government at this time, and he had clearly burnt any bridges that he may have had left in the Pentagon with his TTSA theatrics. So I have to wonder who exactly Lou was attempting to do business with in the San Diego area during this time frame while he finished out his final days at TTSA. There are numerous Lockheed Martin and subsidiary companies in the San Diego area, so I can only assume that it was some sort of defense industry contractor that Lou was trying to do business with as the city is full of those sorts of businesses. But of course, only Lou could tell us for sure I guess that this is yet another unanswered question that we get when we ask, Who's Lou? Whatever it was that Lou was up to in San Diego seemed to come to an end in January 2021 when Lou would then sell his Ramona, California home. And just like every other aspect of Lou's public life, there's something odd about this transaction as well. You can tell by the tax assessments that the value of the home stayed at around $800,000 for the time that Lou lived in the home. However, when they sold the home, the buyers paid an additional $200,000 over the tax assessed property value. Now, at first, that seemed awfully suspicious to me, but I may have some form of an answer here. While running down a lead earlier in the investigation that ultimately ended up being a dead end, I was looking at some satellite imagery of the Elizondo property, and I noticed that there was an RV parked in the parking space outside the house. So maybe Lou sold the RV along with the home to justify the extra $200,000 paid over market. I've actually heard of such things like that happening before in real estate transactions, so it's possible. However, while I was running the same lead down, 
I came upon two more relevant points. One was a rumor that I had heard that Lou had been in the Florida area in 2018 during his time with TTSA, which I simply could not confirm and as such could simply be a rumor. And second, while I was running a nationwide business search on Lou Elizondo, I found a business started in Orlando, Florida, the same year that Lou bought this home in California. The business was called K&K Tile Services. There are two registered owners to the business currently. One is a person named Sarai Alonzo, and the other is Luis Elizondo. In an effort to learn more about this business, I attempted to contact everyone named Sarai Alonzo in the Orlando area and received no responses, which was strange. And another strange thing about this company is that the registered place of business is a condominium. And so I really wasn't able to figure out much about this K&K tile. In fact, all I could tell you about the company is that it was started in 2018, just days before Lou purchased his California home, and that the owner's names are Luis Elizondo and Sarai Alonzo. But that's all I could tell you about it. I even ran a newspaper archive search for K&K tile services and found nothing. But I did find something for Sarai Alonzo and Luis Elizondo. I found this birth notice dated 2007, which shows that Sarai Alonzo of Orlando had a child with the last name of Elizondo. However, no birth father was given. Lou Elizondo says he has two daughters and cites them as his greatest accomplishment, playing the role of devoted father and family man. However, I could only find records for the birth of his first daughter and not his second. Additionally, I could find no record of anyone else living with Lou and Jennifer except the daughter who was born in 1996. Was this child in Orlando Lou's second daughter? And who is the mother of this child? What sort of a relationship do these people have with Lou, his wife, and his other daughter? And there is also the suspicious timing of the business as well. K&K Tile Services was formed on August 27, 2018. And if you look at the purchase date for Lou and Jennifer's Ramona, California home, the original contract for the sale of the home was dated September 7, 2018, just days later. This led me to ask, how does a guy who is supposedly working for TTSA find the time to cultivate his next business relationship in San Diego while flying to Florida in 2018 to start a tile business with someone who is obviously not his wife that he may have had a child with back in 2007. It seems that while digging into k, &K Tile Services more thoroughly, I may have accidentally stumbled upon the birth notice for Lou's second child and a business that he might have started with the mother of that child, which again is clearly not his wife but I have no way of knowing for sure. I guess these are just more unanswered questions that we've come across when we ask ourselves, who's Lou? Back in California in January 2021, Lou and Jennifer completed the sale of the Ramona home. When the property sale was done, it looks like they walked away with about $260,000 cash. If you add in the suspected $100,000 from the West Virginia property, you'll see that you get about $360,000 in real estate and cash profits. Now, I need to interject something right here. I personally find the revealing of such intimate personal family and financial information to be distasteful. And I had a serious moral dilemma while trying to decide if I should include this information in the documentary. However, when I saw this clip from January 3rd, 2021, from an interview on The Black Vault with John Greenwald, I felt that this information needed to be included. Watch this clip and bear in mind that this interview on The Black Vault is exactly 10 days before Lou contracted to sell his California home for $260,000 profit. I got you. So you... Yeah, because I think they knew that I was going to wind up working at... You know, I got to be careful. Though. I, I don't want to put a plug in for it. I was going to wind up working, you know, at a... At a probably at a supermarket uh, just to... Uh, 
just to pay my bills afterwards because you know even though i had left the department I, I i'm not the age of retirement yet i can't collect my pension so you know i, I still i still needed employment and later on in the year, Lou would go on to say a similar thing on TMZ when he made allegations that the Pentagon threatened to take away his security clearance. I was told by a senior representative who was in my chain of command that this whole thing was crazy and it sounded silly and that I better come and talk to him, otherwise it will affect my security clearance. And, and people are going to think I'm crazy. And lo and behold, it turns out that, yeah, my, my security clearance is absolutely be now being threatened. Have they tried to block you from getting a job since you left the Pentagon? Well, you know, it's, it's a little more sophisticated than that. What they do is they, they threaten your security clearance. With my background in counterintelligence as a, you know, in security, a former special agent, that's all I'm qualified to do. So they know by cutting that string, um, in essence, that, that keeps me from from being able to, to, to stay employed. And so that's a very clear way of saying, hey, you better mind your manners, you better shut up, otherwise we're gonna shut you up. In both cases, Elizondo is trying to imply that he must maintain his security clearance so that he can work for the defense industry to pay his bills and feed his family. So with my background in counterintelligence, as a, you know, in security, a former special agent, that's all I'm qualified to do. Yeah, because I think they knew that I was going to wind up working at, you know, I got to be careful, I, I, I don't want to put a plug in for it. I, I was going to wind up working, you know, at a, at a probably at a supermarket uh, just to uh, just to pay my bills afterwards. Less than two weeks after making this statement to John Greenwald at the Black Vault, Mr. Elizondo had profited $260,000 from the sale of his home. So I felt that this personal, albeit public, financial information about Lou Elizondo needed to be included as it directly contradicts Mr. Elizondo's previous public statements that his livelihood was ever in jeopardy. And while I personally know quite a few people who work in service positions, such as actual supermarket clerks, probably at a supermarket, none of them are flipping houses for $260,000 profit. So I guess this is just one more of those endless contradictions that you stumble across during your journey into the rabbit hole when you ask, who's Lou? The Elizondo and TTSA partnership would come to an end in late December 2020. There are many rumors about what truly happened at TTSA to cause the key players to quit. Some speculate it was because Tom DeLong was vocal on social media about his political views. Although I personally do not think that was the case because a scan of Tom DeLong's tweets show that before Lou joined TTSA in 2017, Tom was extremely vocal about his political views. But after Lou and the rest of the players joined TTSA, DeLong actually toned down his public commentary and would keep his political views to himself for a while at least until after Elizondo and Christopher Mellon quit TTSA. And then Tom would begin his political diatribe up once again, continuing to bash the ex-president. This leads me to believe that while Elizondo and the rest were at TTSA, they were able to control DeLong enough to get him to stop publicly talking about politics. So it makes no sense to me that they would leave because of DeLong's tweets if they were able to control those tweets. You wouldn't have been going to Mars if my opponent won. Other observers have speculated that the breakup at TTSA was due to the results of the 2020 election and that whatever plan was underway hinged on a re-election by President Trump. And so the plan was foiled with an unexpected result at the polls. President Trump is purging the top ranks of the Pentagon. Meanwhile, President Trump is purging the top ranks of the Pentagon. Well, Donald Trump still has 70 days to go as president of the United States until the 20th of January. So he can basically still do what he wants and appoint whom he likes. So gone, as you said, uh, is Mark Esper, Jen Stewart, James Anderson, Joseph Cannon. And sources within the Pentagon have been saying, well, this is like a series of beheadings that is taking place within the Pentagon, uh, the White House 
clearing out the Pentagon of its civilian officials and placing in its own pawns uh, in a bid to make it more political. There's really no way for us to know for sure what happened over at TTSA to cause the breakup. So I guess we'll just have to add that one to the pile of unanswered questions that have come up during the delve into Who's Lou? For whatever reason, on December 20th, 2020, Lou Elizondo announced that he was officially leaving to the STARS Academy of Arts and Sciences. But just like in every other part of Lou's life, he never quits one relationship or job until he has another one strategized, planned, and underway. In late 2020, I decided to focus on disclosure advocacy at the global level, and this is where our journey begins. Three months before Lou resigned from the TTSA, Lou Elizondo began the first stages of his Plan B and joined Twitter in August 2020. Specifically, he would target a group of sincere UFO and extraterrestrial truth seekers that were bound by a hashtag, UFO Twitter. Lou would join their ranks making the following promises. 1. I will always tell you the truth. 2. I will own my mistakes and hold myself accountable. 3. Everyone will be treated with respect, no matter their position. 4. Abuse or hatred towards others will not be tolerated. 5. I will always push for full disclosure. I myself used UFO Twitter for about a year or so before Lou joined the scene, and I would like to add a quick personal observation at this point for context. UFO Twitter began after the formation of To The Stars Academy as a pro-TTSA hashtag on Twitter. The group would quickly grow to encompass most mainstream ufology, with such topics as Bob Lazar and Storm Area 51, as well as TTSA News. My personal interaction on UFO Twitter was mostly passive, as I would post occasionally, but I would read it frequently. The overall attitude could become confrontational at times, but the rare arguments seemed to flare out just as quickly as they had started. It was generally an accepting place. However, all of that started to change in August of 2020. Things began to get a bit more polarizing and divisive. Things slowly began getting more drastic, more aggressive, more us versus them thinking. There were more factions and cliques that popped up on the scene, and a central figure emerged from the chaos to crown himself the king of the new UFO order. Lou had taken over. In fact, in this clip right here, he is talking about his rise to celebrity status that began with TTSA, but was solidified on social media. You know, there's, that's the problem with this community. A lot of people have 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 tried to own the narrative, um, and and now that information is coming out that doesn't comport to their narrative. And frankly, they've made a few bucks on it. Um, they've got a choice: either get on board the new train uh, or or fight it uh, and and resist it with everything they have. And um, you know, I think we're seeing that play out to some degree. Now, that is about as far as I'm going to go with the personal observations and opinions here, as I am trying to keep this documentary as factual as possible. However, I simply wanted to add that piece of context because most people will not understand why a simple hashtag on Twitter is so important. But when you hear this next part, I think it will make more sense. For the previous two years, ever since joining to the Stars Academy, Lou had been making the rounds in the mainstream media, hitting such shows as Tucker Carlson, CNN, and 60 Minutes. But those spots and opportunities seemed to slow down and die off as the relationship at TTSA reached its end. So after Lou took over UFO Twitter, as I put it earlier, it didn't take long for him to meet some of the larger YouTube UFO and esoteric livestream channels. And so he began appearing on live streams and doing interviews with select channels within the UFO community. Why did I say select? Because there was a small but vocal minority of people on UFO Twitter and YouTube who questioned the validity of most of Mr. Elizondo's claims. And as I pointed out earlier, the platform had become extremely polarized around the subject of Lou Elizondo. 
This led to a constant culture where anyone who would question the claims that Lou was making would be swamped with hateful responses, trolling, personal attacks, and general negativity. Of course, none of this came from Lou directly, but he would sit back and watch it happen while saying nothing, and in some cases, even clicking the little heart icon next to the post to love it. But this was a two-pronged attack, where Lou simultaneously engaged and distracted his critics on UFO Twitter, a platform that he controlled. But his real objective was establishing himself in the YouTube community on live streams, on select channels, the select channels with people who he could check out beforehand to see if they were friendly or not to his story. But if they fall into a category that Lou calls haters and are questioning of him, he would decline the interview. No, no, I think a lot, I think a lot of the pushback that you're getting from uh, the, the, the people that you thought would be, some of the people you thought would be championing you in the UFO community and you're getting the brunt of that kinetic nervousness, anxiety, and fear. Yeah, and, and, and that's okay. I You know, I get it. Um, you know, shooting the messenger is an old cliche that's been around a long time, and uh, it's only around because, you know, uh, it, it's happened a lot. Um, you know, my, my, my intent, my hope with this conversation is simply just to, to, to speak the truth and allow people to absorb what this, this topic means to them. Um, I've never prescribed uh, a narrative to this. I've never prescribed uh, a motivation or an origin. Using this scratch and sniff tactic to feel out people and channels before accepting interviews, Lou started at the top hitting the biggest shows that were friendly and would have him as a guest. This sort of unfiltered access was pivotal for Lou because YouTube channels and live streamers have no content editors or legal departments, as most of them are just like I am, a one-man show. Lou would manipulate this fact to his advantage and use these friendly, unfiltered platforms to go on a spree of live stream appearances while reaching millions of more viewers. But this was always a two-man job, and since Tom DeLong was out as the public face for his plan, Lou needed someone to replace him. That is where George Knapp came into play once again. Mr. Knapp had been following the TTSA story closely, and he continued to follow Elizondo as well, being the first to break most of the stories concerning Lou. And so George introduced Lou to a man named Jeremy Corbell. Right. So the Pentagon confirmed that uh, I was able to obtain and release unclassified images and footage with my mentor in journalism, George Knapp. Jeremy Corbell had recently finished his Bob Lazar Area 51 documentary, which received mixed reviews. And now that Tom DeLonge and the TTSA were out of the picture, that left a hole in the roster, a hole that Jeremy Corbell filled nicely. And now that the team was once again full, these two would head on a talking spree, one more time igniting a mainstream media UFO frenzy. And these are under intelligent and control, and they're flying and with so impunity, Tucker, within our airspace, that is coming forward, and uh, so they can outmaneuver, uh, outperform have, have to, um, anything that process. we seem to have. And their also, mode of transportation is, uh, seems magical to us. The US it's has unbelievable, and now finally we're having a rational, sober discussion about this because we don't know what these are. Only this new operation was geared around a fiasco that the UFO community called the 180-day Pentagon UFO Report. The 180-day report was sold for months in the mainstream media and on social media as a huge step forward for disclosure. As this could be the most consequential thing to happen to this country, to this world, maybe ever. In June, the United States government is set to release a public report on everything it knows about UFOs. Lou Elizondo is the former head of the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. He's been on the show a number of times. He just spoke to the New York Post about what that report will show. According to Elizondo, we will find an intelligence failure on the part of the U.S. intel community on the level of 9-11. 
In the mainstream media, Elizondo and Corbell spoke endlessly about advanced flight characteristics, physics-defying movement, and a strange unknown threat. I suspect that the media campaign was a way to put pressure on the Pentagon to release something good and juicy in the 180-day report, but it backfired in two ways. First, when the 180-day report was finally delivered, it had a whopping three pages of content in it after removing the title pages, indexes, and irrelevant information. The report had such a lackluster response in the UFO community after all the months of hype, it had received the nickname of Nothing Burger. Some folks were speculating that the government was trying to cover things up by using this meager report. Others were speculating that the flimsy 180-day report was a sort of jab in the eye to Elizondo from the Pentagon, because Lou had spent months in the mainstream and on social media trying to pressure the Pentagon into releasing something huge. So they responded with the report that encompassed only data that Elizondo already had access to, as the 180-day report was extremely narrow in scope and began on the same day as the infamous USS Nimitz Tic Tac footage, a piece of footage Elizondo would later have declassified and would wind up at TTSA with him. Regardless of the cause of the 180-day report being so meager, one thing was clear. Despite all of Elizondo and Corbell's attempts to push the 180-day report in the mainstream media, the efforts had failed, but not just failed, they had backfired, because there was a genie that they had let out of the bottle this time. The UFO threat. The problem this time around was that Lou and Jeremy Corbell implied a UFO threat to the narrative. Um, anything that we process. seem to have, also, their the mode way, of transportation uh, is, uh, seems magical to us. The US it's government has unbelievable. And now, finally, we're having a rational sober. Years. Now, to people who have studied ufology for a while, the story told by Carol Rosen is a familiar one. Rosen was a friend of the late Warner von Braun, the German scientist that was relocated to the United States after World War II in Operation Paperclip. Von Braun would later go on to be pivotal in the United States space and missile development programs after the war. Good morning, my name is Carol Rosen. In 1974, after being a sixth grade school teacher, I was introduced to the late Dr. Werner Von Braun in the US, the father of rocketry. And we have to prevent the weaponization of space because there is a lie being told to everyone that the weaponization of space is now first being based upon the evil empire, the Russians. There are many enemies, he said, against whom we're going to build this space-based weapon system, the first of whom was the Russians, which was existing at that time. Then there would be terrorists, then there would be third world countries, now we call them rogue nations or nations of concern. Then there would be asteroids, and then he would repeat to me over and over, and the last card, the last card, the last card would be the extraterrestrial threat. Carol Rosen had told Von Braun's story of the possibility of a false flag alien attack in the disclosure event coordinated by Dr. Stephen Greer back in 2001. The sudden insertion of this new alien threat in the narrative by Elizondo and Corbell caused grave concern for Dr. Greer, as he saw all the signs of danger that Warner Von Braun had warned us about. This prompted Dr. Greer to publish a free-to-view, crowd-sourced documentary titled The Cosmic Hoax. In the film, Dr. Greer spoke about a variety of UFO and extraterrestrial topics, but he clearly indicated that he felt that Lou Elizondo was part of a military-industrial complex plot and a misinformation agent. When unacknowledged went viral and got hundreds of millions of people to see it, within months, they stood up the TTSA with Luis Elizondo, who is a famous disinformation operative in the Pentagon, at least amongst intelligence officials that I've met with, and others who are well-known disinformation figures within the UFO subject. That began the whole process of trying to pull the narrative back to, gee, we don't know what these are, 
but here's the evidence that were quote leaking, which wasn't a leak, it was a controlled release. And then they hit the button. So the mainstream media that will take dictation from the intelligence community begins to cover it in the New York Times and CNN and every network around the world. Some people in the UFO community agreed with Dr. Greer. While most of the big names in ufology and others in the community turned on the longtime champion of altruistic disclosure, attacking his body of work and his character in defense of Elizondo. The result was an overwhelming blowback for Lou on social media, where people were challenging the narrative of an alien threat to humanity, calling it petty fear-mongering. At the height of this alien threat fiasco, Dr. Greer publicly challenged Mr. Elizondo to a debate, and the popular UFO YouTube channel Third Phase of Moon was a single voice in a sea of Elizondo supporters to speak out and challenge the narrative being told by Elizondo, publicly supporting Dr. Greer and offering to host the debate between these two UFO powerhouses. Welcome back to Third Phase of Moon. Blake Cousins here. A lot of things going on lately. Dr. Greer's dropping names. He's kind of not very pleased what the narrative is going on within the major media, 60 Minutes. I had about a two hour discussion with him last night. And uh, let me tell you, he's unhinged. He's not happy at all with what's going on. This threat, this constant narrative of aliens are a threat. We gotta watch out for them. He's not happy at all. So this is what we're doing. Dr. Greer has agreed to come on Third Phase of Moon's platform and discuss and debate with Luis Elizondo, Nick Pope, Jeremy Corbell, including Luis Elizondo's lawyer, Daniel Sheehan. They're all invited to come to a debate that we're gonna be having on Third Phase of Moon exclusively in about two and a half weeks. It's gonna take us a little while to organize this major uh, event discussion, conversation, whatever you call it, Dr. Greer is ready to take them all on. Hey, we don't want to have like a major fight. We just want to have a discussion. Obviously, there's one narrative to the story that's going on in the major media, and they're refusing to give the other side of the narrative. And we're, we're really concerned due to the fact that we believe that there is no such thing as an alien threat. We believe if there is a threat by these unmanned craft, these tic-tac, these gimbals, th this is something involved within military or black ops or private corporation technology. Humans are behind it. Before we go any further, it is important that you hear this clip from Mr. Elizondo. But the groundswell that has occurred in the last four years on this topic is, is unprecedented. We have never ever seen this before on this topic like this everybody's engaged and, and you know even the naysayers and, and and the haters on social media you know they play a role too mm -hmm. they really do because because you always you don't ever want an echo chamber you want contrary yeah. you want opposing views and an alternative you know analysis I mean, I, despite his statements that he did not want an echo chamber the facts show yet another contradiction as elizondo declined to meet dr greer in a debate if Lou truly had no problem addressing haters and naysayers, as he put it, and if Lou truly did not want an echo chamber, then why would he decline to debate Dr. Greer on the subject of an alien threat? And if Lou was truly open to discussing a counter point of view other than his own, why does he pre-screen his interviewers and only select channels and personalities that he determines to be friendly to his cause? And here's one more huge contradiction to Lou Elizondo and his statements on the Dr. Greer debate. While speaking about the topic of old UFO personalities and implying Dr. Greer, Lou had this to say. Yeah, yeah. yeah expectation management too, right? They, yeah. they all think that, you know, well, someone's going to come here and deliver us with all the answers. Well, you know, I hate to disappoint you, but I'm not that guy. Uh, I never said I was. And, right. um, you know, there's a, that's the problem with this community. A lot of people have 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 tried to own the narrative um and and now that information is coming out that doesn't comport to their narrative and frankly they've made a few bucks on it um they've got a choice either get on board the new train uh or or fight it uh, and and resist it with everything they have and um you know i think we're seeing that play out to some degree in that clip 
Lou was chastising and implying that old personalities like Dr. Greer were simply promoting disclosure for money. However, it is important to note that just a few months before making this statement, Lou himself had sold his California home for $260,000 profit, a newfound benefit of his recent UFO celebrity status. And this really makes me wonder, who is in this for the money? Well, if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Um, I, I have a hard problem, personal problem with, with anybody charging for, for, for services. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, for me, um, this is not a money making endeavor. Uh, I think, I think we pervert the truth when we do make it a money making endeavor. I think, um, all sorts of things, uh, get introduced into the mix when this becomes about profit. Um, and that's with anybody. Um, this is just another disturbing contradiction that arises when we ask who's Lou. After all of the negative attention centered around the alien threat fiasco, Lou and Jeremy Corbell would eventually backpedal and then go on a short damage control media spin cycle attempting to explain that they really did not mean that UFOs and alien life were an inherent threat to humanity. But it was too late and the damage was done. Shortly thereafter, Lou and Corbell would take the show on the road and begin the lucrative business of attending UFO conventions around the world as paid guest speakers, while Elizondo would continue to sell his story to the mainstream media. Why exactly the international UFO community decided to welcome Mr. Elizondo with open arms, despite the fact that he has no practical UFO experience, is a question that has left many puzzled. Lou continues to go on interviews and live streams and fumble his way through esoteric subjects like psychic vibrations, energy levels, greater consciousness, and extraterrestrial life, all the while looking down at his notes and quoting things like Albert Einstein's theory of relativity and whatnot, just like in this clip. Yeah, look at the slow motion, right. correct. Well, we see this incredible, you know, instantaneous acceleration of hypersonic velocities and, and these incredible maneuvers. It's, it's all relative because if you were inside that bubble, inside that crap, and were to be observing the outside environment, we would all appear to be going in slow motion. Right. And yet, mm -hmm. this is part of Einstein's theory of, of, of relativity and whatnot, that, that both are true. Um, as I've said before, you know, people get into this topic because they think it's neat and it's, wow, oh, neat, you watch Hollywood. But, you know, I, I've often likened this conversation with somebody to like having a conversation about cancer. You know, in this case, the good news is that the, the patient's going to be saved, but, but it's a serious, it's a serious conversation. Look, you're asking, you're asking a society, you're asking countries, you're asking people writ large to reject an existing paradigm in favor of something new. Now, every, let's look at the last time this has happened in history uh, that maybe could be correlated to something like this was with Galileo proving the, the principles of Copernicus that the earth was not the center of the solar system. And it to the point where people refused to even look through his telescope because mm -hmm. what those observations may do would, would, would not comport to their pre-existing notion of how the universe works. And so human beings are very loath to, to look at new paradigms. It's very, it goes back to fear. It's very scary. And so it's unclear why anyone would believe that Lou is some kind of a UFO insider with intimate knowledge of the workings of the universe, when it appears that Mr. Elizondo has simply educated himself well enough on certain subjects to impress those who have little or no knowledge of what he is talking about. This is part of Einstein's theory of, of, of relativity and whatnot, that, that both are true. Who's Lou? It's also about this time in 2020 that Lou and his wife purchased their current home in Wyoming. Oddly, the title deed shows a $459,000 commercial loan that was due in a year. A search of public records in Wyoming failed to show a business in that state for Mr. and Mrs. Elizondo, 
And so I have to question what sort of a loan this was that purchased this home as it was not a VA loan or a conventional mortgage. And one would think that a commercial loan would be linked to a business. And of course, we can only speculate as to why they chose Wyoming to move to. Perhaps it has something to do with this 2016 article that shows that Lockheed Martin is in talks to move to the state. Or maybe this 2020 article stating that large portions of the defense industry are also considering a move to the area as well. I guess all of these will have to be added to the never-ending list of contradictions and unanswered questions that have arised when we ask ourselves, Who's Lou? And here's a few more contradictions that would pop up as Lou would continue to make his rounds on the livestream circuit. Listen to these next couple of clips where Lou is talking about exactly how the three pieces of footage he got declassified ended up at TTSA. The Department of Defense made the decision to release them through the Department of Defense adopts or process, approved the release for exactly the reason why the request was made. So it was completely on the up and up. A tip leaked the videos. Okay, first of all, let's go into a, a, a quick legal definition of quote unquote leaking. Leaking means you take classified information and you provide it in an unauthorized manner. Former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Intelligence, Christopher Mellon, managed to obtain the tapes from the Pentagon. I received the videos, the now famous videos in the Pentagon parking lot from a Defense Department official. This is a case where somebody bent the rules a little bit. That's a leak. Um, that is not the case. First of all, these videos went through a proper classification review process. The documentation at some point will probably come out. I'm not going to provide it. That's not my job. You want it? Get it from the government. They released it. They released, they authorized, let me, let me get this right, they authorized the release of those videos and they did it in writing but um, no one leaked these videos if that was the case I would be in a orange jumpsuit right now and I do not look good in orange so believe me um, somebody bent the rules a little bit the problem with Lou's statements here is that the Pentagon has clearly stated that the videos were released illegally as they had not followed the proper procedures for the release of information. And furthermore, they state here that the only reason that the people involved in the leak are not wearing orange, as Lou put it. No one leaked these videos. If that was the case, I would be in an orange jumpsuit right now, and I do not look good in orange, so believe me. Um, is because the Navy has not initiated a formal investigation into the illegal release of the videos. Now, why do you suppose that the U.S. Navy would not investigate a leak like this? The only answer that I could come up with was that the U.S. Navy already knows who leaked the videos and they are afraid to investigate and prosecute them despite the fact that this person has admitted to committing the crime on national television. I knew this was breaking news for the front page of the New York Times. Former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Intelligence, Christopher Mellon, managed to obtain the tapes from the Pentagon and chose the New York Times to break the story. I received the videos, the now famous videos, in the Pentagon parking lot from a Defense Department official. I still have the originals in the packaging. This is a case where somebody bent the rules a little bit and they did so uh, for the larger good and we're absolutely all better off because of it. Christopher Mellon is the great-great-grandson of Thomas Mellon, an American businessman and judge who founded Mellon Bank of Pittsburgh. Christopher's grandfather, William Mellon, was co-founder of Gulf Oil, and Christopher himself was active in both the Clinton and Bush administrations, acting as a Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense and as the Staff Director of the Senate Intelligence Committee. It seems like Chris Mellon is extremely wealthy and politically well-connected. 
Apparently, Christopher Mellon and Lou Elizondo have become attached by a chain at the neck at some point, as they both joined TTSA at the same time, they both quit TTSA at the same time, and then they both recently joined Avi Loeb at Harvard's Galileo Project together. And so it seems like the elizondo Mellon partnership will not be going away anytime soon. I guess it would also be monumentally hard to indict someone like Christopher Mellon, even with ironclad evidence. Someone with the massive amount of money and political power that Christopher and his family wield could make life extremely miserable for some mid-level prosecutor or investigator from the Pentagon who decided to rock the boat by formally investigating the matter and not just letting it go away. But it's a moot point anyways, because even if the proper channels had been followed for the release of the videos, this second email from the Pentagon spokesperson clearly shows that TTSA, as a so-called industry partner, would not have been allowed to release the videos anyways, as, quote, only an official government office can release official government information to the public. An industry partner would not be cleared to release the videos directly to the public themselves, end quote. So, it certainly appears that the videos were indeed leaked to the TTSA illegally, and that the only reason that no charges were filed was because no investigation was made. Most likely because the whole conspiracy was sheltered under the Mellon family political umbrella. And I say conspiracy because that is exactly what appearances suggest. It looks like a group of at least three individuals conspired to commit an illegal act, and at least one of them, Lou, was working for the DoD at the time and an active member of the military. I can simply come up with no other explanation that fits the facts, except that Lou Elizondo conspired to declassify the footage and possibly also to hand the footage over to Mellon anonymously. Meanwhile, Christopher Mellon conspired to remove the videos from the Pentagon and to deliver them to the TTSA. Meanwhile, Tom DeLong conspired to use the videos to promote to the Stars Academy, and possibly even George Knapp conspired to report on it all in the mainstream media in a favorable light and to call the whole thing UFOs. A secret Pentagon program to study unknown aerial objects, otherwise known as UFOs. What about those UFO videos? Well, remember the UFO videos? UFOs, unknown technology. UFO study. UFOs. Oh, it's always so fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, George. This whole conspiracy was motivated by an agenda of profit and was most likely illegal. All of these, too, will be added to the list of contradictions that arise when we ask, Who's Lou? So, where is Lou today? Well, according to this next clip, apparently, sometime in 2021, Lou obtained employment with some form of a company that requires a security clearance from the Pentagon. One can only assume that that is some sort of a defense industry position, as they are the only ones that require this type of clearance for employment. Six months ago, on an interview with Lou Jimenez over at the Unidentified Slip Bureau Reviews, he revealed that I'm a government contractor. And at that time, you said, that's all I'm prepared to say at this time. Some time has passed. Can you give us any additional clarification? Are you uh, government contracting directly for the government or someone in a particular industry? I, you know, I really can't. I have to be mindful of the privacy of the, of the company I work for and, and the roles and responsibilities and the duties. Um, you don't have to but, name but, the company. It's just the, the Well, category. let's just say it's synergistic to, 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 to my, my previous efforts. And I'll leave it at that. Interesting. Cool. Well, it's a, it's a little bit soft. At least we know you're not directly going for the government. You're working for a company now. So that gives us right. some clarity to a degree. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Not meaning to you give said, you. One thing you said before, though, Lou, is that everything you do is for the benefit of the American people. And that's who you work for at the end of the day. So Absolutely. Even working for a private contractor, you're still advancing the narrative of what's best for 100%, the American people. 100%, Rob. 100%. And I can tell you too, same with the people that, that I work with. Uh, they're equally committed. 
So when Lou is not busy working for some unnamed defense industry company, sometimes you can find him mystifying mainstream journalists with embellished tales that sound like something out of a science fiction movie. From Skinwalkers at the Pentagon. As he enjoyed his steak tartare, Elizondo regaled those around him with some war stories, including one hair-raising exploit about how his advanced intuition and remote viewing capabilities had saved his life and the life of his men while on a covert combat mission in war-torn Afghanistan. Lou was one of that rare breed, an astute, detailed, orientated analyst with an open mind. Other times you can find him at a select few of the larger UFO conventions front and center with other notable figures in the field who have been studying the UFO phenomenon for decades. And every day we see a lot more of these so-called experts coming out of the woodwork, people who are critical of the work you're doing, people who are critical of the work that uh, the words that are coming out from the government, whether it's Jeremy Corbell's videos, whether it's statements from the Pentagon. How are you handling this newfound criticism that is jumping out of nowhere? And yet other times you can still find Lou on live streams and podcasts at least the ones that he determines are friendly and won't push him too hard on his evasive answers. But the groundswell that has occurred in the last four years on this topic is, is unprecedented. We have never, ever seen this before on this topic like this. Everybody's engaged. And, and you know, even the naysayers and, and, and the haters on social media, you know, they play a role too. They really do, because because you always you don't ever want an echo chamber. You want contrary. Yeah. You want opposing views and and alternative you know analysis. Sure. Like, and I, well, Dave, you know, thank you for having the patience. You know, I've I spent a career with 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 these hands, you know, destroying people's lives uh, in the name of national security. And I, I really am trying to spend the last half of my life trying to, to put human beings back together again. And we're going to, uh, we're going to do that. So we're going to do that. For, for, no, you know, I, nothing I try to not to, to get, get, you know, animated too much, but. Right. Lou was even spotted in London recently at GQ magazine's heroes, 2021 event where he was the center of attention. As a guest speaker, Lou was no doubt comfortable in his role regaling the crowd with stories of UFOs and his soldier days in Afghanistan. However, there is something interesting that I noticed from this recent event. Previous to the event, Lou had made a post on Twitter indicating that his wife was in London with him. And when I saw this photo, I immediately assumed that it was Lou, his wife, and their daughter. I even noticed that the young lady appears to have the facial characteristics of both Lou and this other woman. However, due to privacy concerns for Lou's wife and daughter, I have chosen to censor these features in this documentary. I was a little shocked and confused when the photo named these women as Heather Gray and Emily Thomas. I searched the rest of the GQ Heroes page for any mention of these two women and could find none. A further internet search of the two names and GQ or Elizondo resulted in nothing. I spent quite a bit of time attempting to figure out who these two women were and can find no evidence of a Heather Gray or Emily Thomas that matched these two descriptions anywhere but in this single photograph with Lou Elizondo at the GQ Heroes event in 2021. All of these facts lead me to believe that this photograph is most likely a picture of Lou, Jennifer, and their daughter. But I have to wonder why anyone would lie about their names. The only reason that I could think of to lie about the names would be to protect the identity of Lou's wife and daughter. However, if someone were really worried about protecting another's identity, would it be prudent to have them accompany you to a high-profile media event at an international men's fashion magazine and then have them be photographed? That seems imprudent to me. And so I have to wonder why the milk toast attempt to hide the names of Lou's wife and daughter when those names are already public information. Why lie when you don't need to? It would seem that here we have just another of the many unanswered questions and contradictions that arise when we ask, who's Lou?
here's a few more of the many contradictions that came up during Lou's live stream appearances online recently. You know, my, my, my intent, my hope with this conversation is simply just to, to, to speak the truth and allow people to absorb what this, this topic means to them. Um, I've never prescribed a, a narrative to this. I've never prescribed a, a motivation or an origin. The I team's George Knapp recently sat down with the former intelligence officer. The conversation is about UFOs. Um, I've never prescribed a, a narrative to this. It's it's nicely and that control, and control and they're flying and with so impunity there is Tucker within our airspace. And in this clip here, it's difficult to tell if Lou is describing the people that he is allegedly fighting against in the Pentagon or the ones that he is working for in the defense industry. You have, let's say, a couple people that have been working this diligently for a very long time. And um, you know what? Haven't been briefing Congress. And you know what? Haven't been briefing the Secretary of Defense or the Director of CIA. They just been kind of running this under the radar for a while. Now, back in the past, it had some had some potentially some oversight, but now it doesn't. And yeah. every time the government has said, for the record, do we have a UFO program? The answer has been no. In fact, it's been crickets. And so we've been reporting to Congress. And now it comes out that, you know what, Joe Schmo, Jane Smith, you guys were running this for the last 20 years um, and you didn't have the authority to do it. You weren't reporting to the SAPCO. You weren't reporting to Congress. You weren't reporting to the Department of Defense. You were running an illegal operation. You're going to go to jail. And in one single online interview, Lou gave three different reasons behind his motivations for disclosure. But I'm not doing this to 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 make friends. Uh, I'm I'm doing this for for a very deeply personal reason, um, and it's and it's to to tell tell the truth, tell America what 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 really their tax dollars was paying for and what what we found. Uh, I I do it because I, I believe in the cause and I believe the people uh, who are who are part of this effort. Well, Dave, you know, thank you for having the patience. You know, I've I spent a career with 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 these hands. You know, destroying people's lives uh, in the name of national security. And I, I really am trying to spend the last half of my life trying to, to put human beings back together again. But in this clip, Lou is clearly implying that his motivations are financially tied to the defense industry. Company A, and Company B. And um, for whatever reason back in the past, let's say hypothetically, hypothetically, so let me, let me caveat that. Hypothetically, um, we recover some sort of strange material that falls out of the sky. And these two companies are competing with each other, but company A looks shiny and pretty. And so we say, you know what, we're gonna give this material to company A to take a look at. You go ahead and tell us what you think, and you can hold on to it for 20, 30 years. Meanwhile, company B, who's competing with company A in the same aerospace environment, let's say, for big planes and rockets and whatnot, um, they go bankrupt uh, because they, had an, uh, they did not have the unfair competitive advantage that company A had. Company B is now defunct, 100 people lose their jobs, and company B now is history, no longer exists. Meanwhile, company A becomes a, a multi-billion dollar, um, you know, a, a part of the military complex, industrial complex, and, you know, is now uh, billions and billions and billions of dollars now uh, in, in the and black market. Right. And now, now it comes out that, well, you know what, company A did happen to have material, exotic material, and it did give them a, a fair competitive advantage. For 40 years. And in recent clips, Elizondo has also stated that his previous specialty was declassifying technologies and information for widespread law enforcement use, including the private defense industry. So the initial intent, John, was to have a unclassified repository because that was my experience before when I was working in the Department of Defense, is really setting up these special enclaves where you could share very sensitive national level intelligence via what we call a terror line and getting that information down to a level could be consumable by by anybody out there that's you know local law enforcement state authorities anybody like that um, but my point being is that uh, we were trying to create a an enclave that allowed us to share this information that came from u.s government sources to a broader audience and in industry uh the, you know the, the big boys, Boeings of the world, and the Raytheons, and that's that's actionable information. But it was super classified, so you have to come up with a mechanism where people who don't necessarily have a security clearance can access really, really classified information. So there's a mechanism to do that. So that kind of was my forte for some time. So 
Who's Lou? But the groundswell that has occurred in the last four years on this topic is is unprecedented. We have never, ever seen this before on this topic like this. Everybody's engaged. And, and you know, even the naysayers and, and, and the haters on social media, you know, they play a role too. Yeah. They really do because because you always, you don't ever want an echo chamber. You want contrary, yeah. you want opposing views and, and alternative, you know, analysis. And every day we see a lot more of these so-called experts coming out of the woodwork, people who are critical of the work you're doing, people who are critical of the work that uh, the words that are coming out from the government, whether it's Jeremy Corbell's videos, whether it's statements from the Pentagon. How are you handling this newfound criticism that is jumping out of nowhere? Well, look, I've said before, the truth has nothing to hide and, and I'm not I'm not a stranger to criticism. After hearing Mr. Elizondo make similar statements over the years, I assumed Lou would be open to speaking to me about this documentary. I made multiple attempts to contact Lou for an interview to give Mr. Elizondo a chance to comment on, confirm, or deny any of the information presented in this documentary. Lou Elizondo failed to respond to my repeated requests for an interview, and so that leaves it up to us to figure out Who's Lou? There is a mountain of evidence that I uncovered during my investigation into the question of who is Lou Elizondo. If you wish to check my sources or inspect the original documents that I have presented in this documentary, you can find all of the information on whosloumovie.com along with the original source links. All of this information is public and can be found by anyone with internet access. When all of the stories are washed away and the simple facts surrounding Luis Lou Elizondo are examined, we see the portrait of a man comprised of many direct contradictions. Was Lou's upbringing some sort of a mix between the movies Revenge of the Nerds and Roadhouse? Or was it simply a normal childhood? What is a nerd? Can I buy you guys a drink? <laughs> Guess not. Well, remember the UFO videos released by the Pentagon? It was late last year. Apparently, there are still more lurking in the military files. In fact, a man who spent 10 years working on the government's secret study of UFOs. Elizondo spent 10 years as head of a secret study of unidentified aerial objects. Did Lou actually spend close to a decade hunting UFOs at the Pentagon? Or did he spend four years volunteering at an advanced foreign technology study while officially assigned elsewhere? Was Lou truly the Pentagon's top UFO hunter, or was he a mundane desk jockey commissioned to study foreign countries' advanced aerial threats? Was Lou some sort of a super soldier with psychic remote viewing powers, or simply a purveyor of embellished war stories? Is Lou truly a Pentagon UFO whistleblower? a patriot, and a hero? Or is he a man that stole valor for such actions while conspiring with others to commit illegal acts against the U.S. government for profit? Is Lou a champion of true UFO disclosure for the benefit of all humanity? Or is he a part of a modified version of disclosure that will only benefit the defense industry and himself financially? I don't want to put a plug in for it. I was going to wind up working, you know, at a, at a probably at a supermarket uh, just to uh, just to pay my bills afterward. Is Lou a man who risked his family's well-being by speaking out about his UFO involvement? Or is Lou a man who failed with finances, businesses, and patents before finally getting rich quick with his UFO story? My name is Lou Elizondo. For nearly the last decade, I ran a sensitive aerospace threat identification program focusing on unidentified aerial technologies. It was in this position I learned that the phenomena is indeed real. 
Well, Dave, you know, thank you for having the patience. You know, I've I spent a career with 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 these hands, you know, destroying people's lives uh, in the name of national security. And I, I really am trying to spend the last half of my life trying to, to put human beings back together again. We haven't always necessarily agreed on everything and we can agree to disagree. But let me tell you the one thing that I've always expected about you. You are you are one of the most tenacious and probably one of the most uh, global experts on the FOIA process. Is Lou sincerely an empathetic and caring individual? Or is he a person who manipulates others with his psychological training and charisma? Is Lou Elizondo a new age guru of infinite truth? Or is he a simple con man that will say anything to get what he wants? We will have to add all of these questions to the list of contradictions and unanswered questions that arise when we ask, Who's Lou? I have been trying to come up with a single word to describe Lou Elizondo after weighing all of the evidence presented in this documentary. And I found something curious while I was downloading images from Lou's webpage, LuisElizondoOfficial.com. Wannabe. The American Heritage Dictionary of the English Language, 5th edition, defines a wannabe as one who aspires to a role or position, one who imitates the behavior, customs, or dress of an admired person or group. A product designed to imitate the qualities or characteristics of something. Wannabe. I think that pretty much sums it up. I think Lou Elizondo fits all three of those definitions in varying contexts. And I didn't even say it, because he himself named this image Wannabe-1 and uploaded it to his own Luis Elizondo official webpage. And if you don't believe me, head on over there and check it out when you're done watching this documentary. And so I think with this simple oversight, we finally have an answer from Lou Elizondo himself to the question of who's Lou. Lou Elizondo, in his own words, is a wannabe. Lou Elizondo was a wannabe businessman and doctor in high school. So he went into college to study medicine, but turned into a wannabe jock when he started wrestling and took a job as a bouncer in an alleged bully what team. Can I buy you guys a drink? Then Lou was a wannabe G-man at the Pentagon, while in reality, he was a simple desk jockey. Lou Elizondo was a wannabe soldier when he titled this picture Wannabe One and uploaded it to his official webpage in a transparent attempt to steal valor. Lou was a wannabe businessman when he told the journalist who wrote this story that he had started a business named Never Shipped Empty Incorporated, which never existed. Then, Lou was a wannabe whistleblower when he misrepresented the role of ATIP to the world, portraying it as a UFO investigation unit. While the evidence shows that ATIP was most likely an advanced foreign threat study. Then, Lou was a wannabe political player when he was rubbing elbows with Harry Reid and swore loyalty to Christopher Mellon. Then Lou was a wannabe ufologist, plagiarizing others' stories and repeating philosophies that he has read in books while portraying them as his own. And now, Lou is a wannabe social media influencer, selling to the defense industry the notion that Lou is the king of ufology on social media and in the mainstream media. Lou's role appears to be a basic lobbyist for a modified form of disclosure that will reveal only the technology his employers can profit from having declassified. 
He promises to always tell the truth, which seems to be the first of many exaggerations, contradictions, and outright lies that he will tell over the years. Lou promises to push for full disclosure. However, he only seems interested in disclosure that benefits the defense industry and its taxpayer-funded special access project spending spree. You will never hear Lou speak about the government having access to free, renewable, zero-point energy and wanting that technology declassified. Lou will never speak about the government having access to a cure for cancer or some other advanced medical technology and wanting that declassified. The only form of declassification Lou is pushing for is propulsion technology that might also be used as weapon technology. So Lou can say whatever he wants, but his actions and the money in this case all tell us why he is truly doing it. One thing you said before though, Lou, is that everything you do it's for the benefit of the American people, and that's who you work for at the end of the day. So Absolutely. So even working for a private contractor, you're still advancing the narrative of what's best for 100%, the American people. 100%. 100%. And I can tell you, too, same with the people that, that I work with. He's doing it to get rich and to make his defense industry employers rich as well. That's it. It's basic greed. Luis Daniel Elizondo IV, in his own words, is a wannabe Lou Elizondo. He wants to be a super spy. He wants people to think his name is on an Al-Qaeda hit list. He wants people to think he has some sort of psychic remote viewing powers. He wants people to think that he ran a UFO study at the Pentagon for close to a decade. He wants people to think that he has some sort of insider knowledge of a UFO cover-up at the military. He wants people to think that he is a Pentagon UFO whistleblower. He wants the defense industry to think that he has successfully infiltrated and now controls the ufology subculture in a role of controlled opposition. Lou wants everyone to think that he is a man of mystery, but it's all wannabe. It's all imitation. It's all lies told in an attempt to manipulate you into thinking something that is not true. When you wipe away all of the smoke and stories and grandeur and smiles and compliments, and when only the evidence is looked at exclusively, it becomes abundantly clear that there is nothing mysterious about this man and his stories at all. It's all simple manipulation. The man will say anything to get what he wants. Lou Elizondo told the world he was a mysterious Pentagon UFO hunter for close to a decade. For nearly the last decade, I ran a sensitive aerospace threat identification program focusing on unidentified aerial technologies. It was in this position I learned that the phenomena is indeed real. While the evidence shows that Lou was a person who lived a normal, everyday life. That is, at least until he quit the Pentagon three years short of full military retirement, conspired to steal some sketchy footage, and then hit it rich with his pals Tom DeLong and Christopher Mellon at To The Stars Academy. However, up until that point, Lou Elizondo led a double life of failed businesses and patents coupled with boring desk work, all the while dreaming of the days when he and his wife could enjoy the lavish life with get-rich-quick schemes such as his suspect nautical patents and phantom business venture Never Ship Empty, which never existed. In my opinion, Lou Elizondo, quite frankly, is not a man to be trusted or he will abuse that trust just like he did when this reporter trusted him and Lou lied to them about his business and patent. And just like he did when the Pentagon trusted him and Lou lied to them to get footage declassified. During the course of this film, I found countless contradictions, vague and conflicting statements, and outright lies. In fact, the only facts that I could confirm about Lou from his official webpage was his name and his college degree. That's it. Every other statement made by Lou about his work history, military experiences, and even his past were unconfirmed or found to be embellished. 
And so, just like all liars, you have to discount the stories that they give you and look at the facts only, which is what we've done here in this attempt to answer the question of, who's Lou? This documentary was an investigation into the public records of a public figure. Any inclusion of personal information was to illustrate the contradictory nature of Mr. Elizondo's public words and the public records, and solely for that purpose. All of the information contained in this documentary was found in the public record and should not be used for harassment, intimidation, bullying, or any other illegal or amoral actions, nor to deny any persons the rights guaranteed in the Federal Credit Reporting Act. The information contained in this film is for educational purposes only. Who's Lou? An extra special thanks to Stephen Cambion at Truth Seekers on YouTube for his consistent support throughout this project and for being a great sounding board for ideas. But... <laughs> Special thanks to Ryan Stacy from the Experiencer Support Association and Blacklight Investigative Services for validating research processes and for verification and sharing of information from their own investigation. Thanks to John Greenwald at the Black Vault for clips from his live stream, his Freedom of Information Act work and resulting documents, and for his coverage of the ATIP and OSAP programs. And to Blake and Brent Cousins for allowed usage of footage from their YouTube channel, Third Phase of Moon on YouTube. And for risking their professional reputation by taking a stand with Dr. Greer against Elizondo and Corbell on the topic of an alien threat, while the rest of the large names in our community seem to have ignored the subject or sided with Mr. Elizondo in fear of missing out on the publicity and the views. Thank you to Rich Giordano at Goofon Radio Network for his support and for clips from his live stream. And for never backing down in his vocal skepticism of Elizondo in spite of the years of harassment and negativity that he has received for stating his opinion. Clips used by Lou Angeles at the Unidentified Celebrity Review, Random Lou Friendly YouTube Livestream, Dave Scott at Spaced Out Radio, that UFO podcast on YouTube, To the Stars Academy, CNN, Fox News, CBS, NBC, 60 Minutes, ABC, and any others are all used under fair use doctrine as defined in the copyright laws of the United States of America as an informative, educational, not-for-profit commentary of a public figure. This film, the research cost for documents and subscriptions, the web hosting costs, and all financial costs associated with this production were entirely paid for out of pocket by me. I am giving this work away for free because I feel that this information should be known by the public in the name of education. I am the only person who worked on this project, committing hundreds of hours of time to research, editing, animating, recording, and scoring the music for this film. If you enjoy my hard work and independent research, consider supporting me by subscribing to the channel and or subscribing on Patreon or making a direct donation by PayPal. You can also stop by any one of my live streams or live premieres and throw a super chat my way if that's more your style. Thank you all for watching and for supporting my work. Please share this film in its entirety everywhere you are allowed to spread awareness. Use the hashtag Who's Lou on social media to discuss this film and Lou Elizondo. You know, again, we 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 have to be mindful with 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 this topic that you know it may seem superficially that it's going to challenge um, religion and and challenge even governments and other institutions and organizations. But at the end of the day, it's the truth, and so we mustn't we mustn't hide from it. Yeah. We must we must you face know. it. I think I think you're right. I think you know a case in point for for the how shall I say the um, 
the scales in which human beings live um, is not just this body. And, and I don't want to get too esoteric, but the reality is, is that um, there are universal truths and then there are personal truths. As always, this has been Manny at Area 503, and I am out of here to continue my search for universal truth. I think, uh, you know, there are a lot of, as I said before, hucksters and fraudsters out there, and it's coming to light. And, you know, people are, there's some savvy investigators now that are hot on the trail of some of these individuals who spent the last several years, if not decades, defrauding people. And, uh, you know, all I got to say is, uh, you know, sucks to be you. You shouldn't have done that. Shame on you.